Come on. They're right there. Let's go. Move, 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 move. This episode of Choices Not Chances podcast is sponsored by Louisiana Gun Shop. Located on Highway 90 West in Broussard, Louisiana, just south of Lafayette. For more information, stay tuned at the end of this episode. This is Choices Not Chances podcast with Ryan and Matt. I'm your co-host, Matthew Charette. Sitting next to me is Ryan Rogers. Ryan. Hey guys, thanks for coming back. And just like always, if you see anything that resonates uh, with you in this episode that you know needs to be shared out, don't be selfish. Also, make sure you go over to choicesnotchancespodcast.com and check out the content on the, on the website that's up and running. And uh, as well, check out uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, give us likes, subscribes, click on that bell on YouTube so you don't miss any of the uh, future content coming out. I got some good ones. We got John Stryker Meyer coming up. We've got Dave Grossman coming up. Uh, we've got Nick the Machine Lavery coming up. So make sure uh, you hit, click on that bell so you can get, uh, get, get into this content as soon as it's released. Uh, today, the guest uh, th- that's on the show is going to answer some questions that I've had for some time, you know, a little over a year now, um, and, and, and talk about an experience, and it has to do with the fallout in Afghanistan. Uh, first, I'm going to read a small passage. It was nearly 2200 in North Carolina as I was wrapping up some work in my studio. My eyes were tired and my thoughts wandering. I paced in the garage watching the coverage on Afghanistan on the news. It was on every channel. U.S. forces were withdrawing from a 20-plus year war and had set timelines for which that was going to happen. Advertising these timelines would have its pros and cons. I was pacing in the garage and cursing the planning efforts of the movement, specifically the closure of Bagram Air Base in Parvin Province. The significance is there were nearly 5,000 Taliban and others convicted of hostilities against coalition forces housed in a prison system at the air base, likely waiting for time to get out and attack American forces once more. For reasons that are still unclear as I write this, decisions were made to close Bagram, and no effort was taken to safeguard the prison or prisoners. The decision likely added to the wave of Taliban sweeping across the nation, ending up in Hamid Karzai International Airport, HKIA, in Kabul, Afghanistan. As the country collapsed into Kabul, fear and terror ripped at the hearts of the Afghan civilians. Would the Afghan and coalition forces leaving what would become of this nation? Would the divine spark of freedom and nationalistic pride burn bright, or fall once more into the hands of bad men? The feelings of the Afghani people were on full display as they rushed, rushed the HKIA air gates, uh, airfield gates and waited through thousands of people to get to what they perceived as a safe place, to what they perceived as their last real shot of leaving before the full grip of the Taliban was realized once more. Many of them have lived under Taliban, be- Taliban control before and would risk everything not to return f- to it. Kabul was buzzing and news stations were all covering the mission. From my garage, I couldn't see a way that everyone would get out of the country before it all fell apart. I was enraged at the thought about the lack of processes to safely execute this non-combatant evacuation. I kept looking at my wife saying that this was all going to fall apart and that it was going to get worse before it got better. The next afternoon was more of the same. Most of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, from my perspective came from North Carolina, came from my, my garage as I'm watching coverage. And then later, you know, a documentary was made about the pullout and about HK and it really um, it showed a different picture than let's say uh, the objective media wanted to show or was showing uh, during the conflict. Um, today my, my guest is um, Gunner Callen. He was 1/8 gunner, battalion gunner during the uh, the fall at you know the, the fall into Hamid Karzai in Kabul, and he, he paints a much different picture of what was going on on the ground. And the reason that it's important um, to get this uh, you know portion of of the story told is that you know everybody on here that follows me knows that I, I refer to the young Marines in the NCO Corps and below as, 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 as national treasures. And that's what they are. And that's what they are to me. And that's what they are to the people that lead them. And on this day, uh, or this week and these instances where you're talking about absolute hell on earth and, you know, potential of being overrun and uh, at the airfield, uh, and he'll talk about how uncommon valor was a common virtue still to this day in the infantry Marine Corps. Uh, so with that, Gunner, 
thanks for coming out, sir. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, and joining me here. I know you're uh, you know got retirement, you got other things going on. You're still a busy man, but you know it's important to important to get these stories out. And I appreciate you coming out and taking the time. I appreciate you having me, brother. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, you've you've heard some of the shows, uh, or or at least a little bit of them, and I like to ask pointed questions in the beginning, and then we'll kind of go from there wherever the conversation takes us. But um, first off, I want to know where you come from, like the culture of your family, uh, mom, dad, sports, brothers, sisters. Well, so I was born uh, in northern Kentucky in Boone County, you know, kind of in the Ohio River Valley. Uh, that's where I grew up, and uh, blue collar family. I didn't really know what exactly my family was as I was growing up because everything that we were doing was just, uh, it was normal. Mm. You know, we started, my first memories are kind of in the suburbs and my mom wanted to stay there, but it seems as we got older, my dad wanted to move more and more out in the country. That's where he was more comfortable. You know, I hunted growing up, stayed outside all the time, played sports um, where I grew up, every kind of athletic little boy during that time. And, you know, the mid eighties was, uh, Played football, baseball, and basketball in Northern Kentucky, and we did that continuously, <laughs> right through up through up middle school, when uh, you kind of divided into your sports that you were good at. You know, the intramurals kind of that's right, <laughs> right? They kind of they kind of ended. Uh, I was not a good baseball player. You know, I played baseball for a number of years as a child. I was not a good basketball player. <clears throat> I uh, played football all the way up through high school. Uh, my freshman year of high school, I did not play my sophomore year, and played again my junior year, and didn't play my senior year. Uh, I kind of went had a love hate relationship with that sport that uh, that we had, but I just remember you know work in my house right. My dad was a you know thirty year teamster right. He got married on a Tuesday. He went to work on Wednesday. Started moving furniture. Went into freight business. Was an over the road truck driver. Mm. Wanted to get off the road, stay at home more, be at home, and uh, he just went to work on the docks. And uh, for thirty years he worked. I think the the teamster contract at the time allowed for 72 hours a week and he worked for 72 hours a week for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just remember dad was all the, all the time at work. Either that and he made, you know, he he went to what he could, but he couldn't go to much. And, uh, my mom worked, she was an office worker and then, you know, ascended to be an office manager. And then, uh, you know, that's just what they did. Mm. And in the off time, my dad hunted occasionally he would fish. And so I would, you know, go hunting with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we hunted at night mostly. So I just waited for the nighttime to come. We go hunting and we'd hunt and wherever he got tired, we, <laughs> we, we, we'd go home and, you know, just go on about the day. But, uh, yeah, it was a rural upbringing, you know, and, and what's now getting more and more kind of urban, but it was a very rural time, you know, in Northern Kentucky in the, uh, the eighties through the early nineties. Check. And siblings? I got a brother, uh, older brother. He's 18 months older than I am okay. and always about six to eight inches taller and about three <laughs> pounds heavier. And, <laughs> and that was some, some pain growing up because I was mouthy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to take anything. And I got, my, <laughs> I got my fair share of beatings you know, from him. Some deserve it, so some not. And he, he hates talking about it. He does not want to relieve those times. But, uh, you know, it helped me morph into what I would become get tough and uh yeah like i like i i got into my later teenage years and even my early teenage years and i'm like well there's nothing anyone's going to do to me put me in more pain than this guy already did right (laughs) i've already i've already felt worse so let's go the joy of a big brother (laughs) yeah but then um but then i would want to leave the house and so i started working i think i was fourth or fifth grade whatever age you are then mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i started walking around to like the the local farms within a few miles of the house and i'm well, fine got find, some work uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah find yeah. guys in the field like hey can i can i work for you and mm-hmm. out of pity or out of like them that's needing to do some something i started weed eating fence rows okay and weed eating fence rows turned into cleaning horse stalls mm-hmm. and cleaning horse stalls turned into baling hay and baling hay turned into doing tobacco and then i got to be 14 15 and a buddy of mine his dad gave him 80 acres to back in a few hay fields. So then we worked for a friend of ours, mm-hmm. right? And the whole group worked together. Well, that's um, dope. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you're, you're hanging out with your buddies all day, just doing work and, and then making it, money. Yeah. And, and it wasn't much money. Like, no, you paid us $5 an hour. <laughs> yeah. But you're 14, 15 <laughs> yeah, years it, old. It was great. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then, you know, you do, 
tobacco the whole summer. You do hay the whole summer. You chop wood in the wintertime. And yep. it's just working outside. And I think that kind of morphed my mind into what I would become. I'm not a guy that can sit in an office or sit anywhere or even being in a factory doing the same thing every day my entire life. I got I to gotta have change. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. that kind of set the foundation of what I would become. And then in sports, I went through – the football, baseball, and basketball through childhood. And once I got to be in high school, finished a freshman year of football, a friend of mine was going to go to the wrestling team to stay in shape for football. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to come with him. I was like, well, I've always been interested in that. I grew up as an 80s baby. Right? The, the movies that we had, Rambo, <laughs> Rocky, Commando, right? These were great First movies. Blood. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, the Van Damme movies coming out in the 90s. It was a great time. Great and, time. uh... So yeah, I'll go learn that. So I went into wrestling and fell in love with it. Oh, yeah. Right? And I fell in love with it because I wasn't good at it. I was horrible at it. Mm, mm. <laughs> right? Um, I couldn't understand why I wasn't good at it. And so I needed to learn this. I needed to do this. Mm-hmm. And it was something that nobody in my family had done. People didn't understand it. So I stopped playing football to wrestle. Mm. And uh, I just kind of charged my own path in that sport that nobody had ever really pursued. Yeah. Um, and that took me into my adult life um, and into one of the hobbies that I had throughout the early part of my career. And and uh, wrestling was a big part of my life going forward from the time that I was a freshman in high school to um, actually just about two years ago. Okay. Right. So, and that's, that's how I grew up. And, you know, going into high school, I was not a good student. Still not a good student to this day. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was a horrible student. I did what I had to do to uh, stay eligible, mm-hmm. right? And that's the only that was the only that was For the only key. Yep, <laughs> stay that was eligible. The driver. Right? That was that was a drive. Was eligibility. Um, mm-hmm. I had a teacher when I was in sixth grade. That uh, one thing that we had to do, and that was back when the all the teachers taught all the subjects. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, when he would teach English. And this guy actually became a state representative for Kentucky, like at the, the state level, the state legislature. He made us memorize poems. And we started with a small poem. I, the poem was Trees by Robert Frost is what we started with. I was in sixth grade, and I still remember this. <laughs> and so we had to memorize poems, and the poems got steadily and steadily more complicated mm-hmm. and longer. To by the end of the year, we had to memorize The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, my God. And then you had to stand up in front of the class and say it word for word. Oh, good. For a grade. How'd that go? I learned how to memorize things. You did it. Right? So I still have this memory that I, if I take time, I can memorize whatever. I don't have a short-term memory worth anything. Yeah. But my long-term memory, I can memorize things. Thank you. And so all these things, I think there's there's a path that people are supposed to be on. And if you truly find your path, you, you are living a life that people dream of. Things come easier. And I think I mm-hmm. found what I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And all these things that I did being in nature, hunting, shooting guns, fishing, right. Getting beat up by my brother, <laughs> yelled at by my dad. Right? Mm-hmm. All these things were getting me ready for what I would eventually venture into mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and join in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. Now, what year did you join? 1999. 99. So pre, pre 9-11. Walk me through. You went to boot camp in um, Paris G- Island, right? Yep. Yep, Paris Island. Any uh, stories that ring a bell from them? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember boot camp very well. Um, yep, it was peacetime. It was actually in September of 98 when I signed into the debt program. Okay. And this is straight out of high school then? Straight out of high school. Okay. I graduated on a Wednesday night, Sunday morning, I was at Paris Island. Boom. Looks right. like that. <laughs> yep. And brought, Recruiter right like that. liked you. Yeah. Well, it, they thought I was too dumb to join the Marine Corps to start. Because <laughs> um, I was the guy. Shows them. I, I was, I don't know why. It seems like certain points in my life, the Marine Corps was always brought up to me in certain ways. Mm. So the first movie I ever saw in a theater was Platoon. Okay. Yeah, that's. Right. Great movie. Still watch it multiple times a year to this day. I know it like the back of my hand, but, you know, I think. You know, Bob Barnes was like the best platoon sergeant ever portrayed in a movie ever, right? Barnes was the guy. Elias was an undisciplined pig. (laughs) (laughs) But when you go into, especially the infantry realm, Mm -hmm. you when once you get to be like the squad platoon level leadership, you're kind of either a Barnes or an Elias. Mm -hmm. Like there's two routes Mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I became a Barnes, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, so I. I was going out, you know, several times throughout my teenage years and in my younger years. Like, I was the the little kid 
in elementary school, I had two friends up the street, and we'd always go in the woods and play war. Yep. I dressed in full camis, right? Mm-hmm. I had all these things and had toy guns and, and was, you know, all the G.I. Joes that I could find. Never had the aircraft carrier because you always had a cousin that had a friend that had one, right? Like, <laughs> you know, that Chuck. was a four-foot-long aircraft carrier. Yeah. You know, that's how... Anyway, so I was always doing things around that. Well, I remember I, we had just got done hunting. My parents had split up. I was at my dad's house. It was 2 or 3 in the morning. We were sitting down having a cup of coffee. I was probably in middle school. And I think, uh, I think my dad brought it to me. He's like, you know, I just ran up roundabout ways just talking about the future and what I was going to do. And he brought up, he's like, I think you'd be happiest in the Marine Corps. Like, I think you would, I think that's, that's where you would be happy at. Oh, wow, the Marine Corps. And, you know, that's. Now, now what, did he have any service? No. Did anybody in your family have they, any? I, like it, there had to be a reason he was thinking that, right? Or so, was it just because of how you were as a kid? I think it's just how I was as a kid. So I've had several Army veterans, several Air Force veterans in my family, really no Marines. Okay, check. Um, I've got several uncles that served in Vietnam, right? Okay. They had, they're had. they not my stories to tell, but I had these horrific experiences in Vietnam, mm-hmm. like love these guys to death. I had one uncle, um, my dad's brother, who was a Korean veteran, right? Loved that guy to death. He passed away a couple years ago. Uh, missing to this day. But, you know, there, there's been military But you had service. influences. You had military influences. Military influences. Okay. Like, my grandfather was in the Navy in World War II, right? So, all these Check. all these things were pointing to military service. And we were, we were proud. So, you're collar. saying, though, like, by a young fourth, fifth grade kid, you're already thinking yeah. that service, that's, that right? may be the way. Yeah. That, I'm, I Check. have it in my head somewhere, right? Check. Yeah. I, I would probably say it to a few people. I don't remember saying it, but everything that I did revolved around the military and somewhat all the toys that I had mm-hmm. video games. I liked, right? Like all the things. Mm-hmm. So we, uh, then later I remember maybe a sophomore in high school, right? With my brother who was a junior at the time out with his friends, which I just sat there and shut up. Because yeah. Yeah. There was the guys that beat me up at practice. Know your place. You know, like, yep. <laughs> And, um, yeah. and I remember, you know, people talking about going to college or whatever. And then I, I said something stupid. I don't know. You know, the, the occasionally like, you just, just slip say up. dumb things. <laughs> I still do it to this day, but it, it just, I said something stupid and, and my brother's friend, he's like, yeah, I, I look at you joining the Marines or something. I was like, oh, well, there's the Marine Corps again. Right. Like, and by the time, the only thing I knew about the Marine Corps was these are, these are the, the baddest, of the bad, right. Yeah. These are the tough guys. These are the ones that you want to be. If you really want to be like a tough guy in the world. Okay, well, the the uh, the pain that I went through in my childhood really kind of gave me a chip on my shoulder, mm-hmm. a short fuse. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the time I was a teenager, I was fighting all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, for fun, or or because you had a short fuse, I had a short fuse, but it was fun too. Yeah, 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 yeah. A little, <laughs> little you know, bit of both. You know, it uh, like I fought as a kid. I fought through the teenage years. Like I just, I, I just fought, and Check. I and I would, I would poke at people. I would find people to poke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not really being a bully, they weren't all smaller than me. I would just poke. Yeah, yeah. And I just get in my mind. I'm going to fight this guy. Yeah. Right? I'm going to poke him until he wants to get him. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and then that's just what I would do. Um, wasn't the best thing to do. I don't. I wouldn't want any of my kids doing that. But it's just, it's what I did. It's what you and, did. Yeah, and I, and I can't explain why. <laughs> so I was walking out. I think I was going to do hay one day. It was it was uh it was August September. It might have been the last cut of hay for the year. I can't remember what I was doing, but I was walking out to my truck to go to work, and I got it in my mind that I was going to join the Marine Corps. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna join the Marine it. Corps. Yep, I'm a senior in high school. I'm joining the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. And so. I think this was like on a Saturday or a Sunday. And I think the next Monday or Tuesday, I drove to Florence, Kentucky, where the recruiter's office still is at for the area. And I walked into the Marine office and I'm like, yeah, I want to sign. Where do I sign? I want to do this. And mm-hmm. they're like, whoa. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> well, it's 1998. They didn't, they didn't have people do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they were, come here. And this recruiter sent me in front of the, the fake ASVAB, like the practice ASVAB. And he's like, let's see if you're smart enough. Yeah, yeah. Because they thought I was slow. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. like, this kid's never... Not going to make Never going to do it. Yeah. So I sat there and scored high enough. And they were like, I think I scored somewhere like mediocre, like 55 or something that might be low. And my daughter eventually scored like two points shy of perfect. (laughs) (laughs) So, so But anyway, I scored high enough to have some openings. Uh And they're like, so what do you want to do? I was like, you guys only have one job, right? Like infantry guys. Isn't that what what the Marines do? do? Yeah. Like (laughs) that's what we do. And they're like, there's other jobs more on. And I'm like, oh. 
your shit. Okay. You know, a lot of our my generation thought the same thing because they were trying to get in so yeah. fast. It was just like, no, yeah. they're fighting the war on yeah, TV. That's, what that's do you mean? What, that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. So my recruiter ended up being an MP. So he talked to me about the MPs. I'm like, all right, fine, I'll do that. Right. I just thought, well, the 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 line of. Well, every Marine is a rifleman. Everybody is an infantryman, but the other people have other jobs too. Mm, like that, that one. Got yeah, That piece of bullshit. <laughs> anyway, so I signed up to be an MP. <laughs> Go through the debt program. My entire senior year comes like March or like April. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, well, you got to be 19 to graduate MP school. You're going to be like three weeks short. So we can't ship you until later in the summer. I'm like, I got to get out of here. I was drinking all the time. Change it. I was drinking all the time. I was partying all the time. I was fighting all the time still. Yeah. I was like, I got to go. And because uh, I had prepared to leave in June, right? I was mentally, I was like, I'm out of here in June. Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, well, you can join the infantry and volunteer for this thing called security forces. It's kind of the same as being an MP. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, fine, let's do that. Bet. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Let's go. And um, so we did that. And then late May, um, they say, Oh, well, there's no security forces spots open, but what you can do is you can volunteer for security forces at SOI. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I was like, great. So we're still leaving in June. Awesome. So I graduate on a Wednesday night, Sunday morning in Paris Island. Go through boot camp, boot leave, get to the school of infantry, go through the sign is an 0311 rifleman, go through that, and they're they had guys that have to come in on a weekend to get measured for their blues for security forces. Mm -hmm. Those are the only ones at the time that had blues issued to them. And yep. I was like, wait, when do I volunteer for security forces? They're like, yeah, we stopped doing that five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the answer was. Like, you're stupid. You're a grunt. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. But yeah, you're no three. This is just what we're going to do we'll now. We'll figure the rest but, yeah, out. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's just what we're going to do now. Right? Well, you don't have, what, what can you do? Yeah, nothing. It's not like you're raising your hand like, well, hang on, my recruiter yeah, told my me. My recruiter said this. Yeah, roger that. At the bud. time, you didn't say that to a sergeant SOI instructor. My yeah. recruiter said no. So nah. I was like, all right, that's what we're going to do. I think they probably still don't treat that very favorably over there. I, I wouldn't think so. Right? Like, I would hope not. <laughs> I Let's hope just say not that. Too. I would hope not. Beat so, me to um, the interns. So I graduated and got to, got to boot camp on June 13th of 1999. Okay. And uh, I felt like I was prepared for boot camp, right? I was in shape. I was like one of the top wrestlers in the state in my weight. We got to boot camp, and then you get to that first week. Bad times. Well, it it's not bad times, but you expect to – you're getting yelled at all the time, right, from the forming instructor. But you no one briefs you on forming, right? Mm -hmm. Like forming is where you get your shots. You go through your medical, oh, and your hearing test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All you do is stand in line all day. Yep. You stand in line at attention – all day. Mm -hmm. And then at certain times, I'll put you in a squad bay and you sit like on the floor, like with, you know, Indian style or your legs crisscross or whatever people want to say these days, right? So you're sitting like that, like a kindergartner online, sitting there and you can't talk or you're, you're rocking eating, penicillin into your butt cheek. Horrible. <laughs> So, like, that week, you really regret your decisions. Like, you know, I'm just going to stand at attention. <laughs> this like is not months. what I thought it would be. But then pickup day comes. Yeah. Where they get you on squad bay, and then the drill, they march them out, and it's all, and then, then they take the drill instructor oath, and then it's go time. Yeah. On. And then you're like, oh, this is what I signed up for. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then you're drilling all the time, but then there's there's weekly things because of, of a little bit into, like, the, you know, the 13 weeks, you kind of figure out what's next, yep. right? Yep. You, there's certain buddies that you have to have, like you always make buddies with the scribes and you young kids out there, it's going to listen to this. You go to Marine Corps boot camp, make buddies with the scribes, they make a fire watch list. They'll skip you. That's so, right. <laughs> so nowhere so to make friends. So I made buddies with the scribe that always saw the training schedule. He could tell us what was coming up. Right. So I had a, a my rack mate, you know, the guy that slept on top of me cause I slept on the bottom, you know, everything's alphabetical order. So like I was good with him. But my whole goal was for them not to know my name. That's right. Right? I was, I was like, you know, I don't even want you knowing my name for the drill instructors. Right? Mm -hmm. So, And they didn't for the longest time. It was like the rifle range where they finally figured out what my name was. <laughs> so, see, you're, you're a bigger guy. They, I'm surprised you weren't right up yeah, front. Yeah, but I was a lot smaller then. Okay. I, okay. I have a much better later in life jeans than early in life. But I, I, yeah, I was you were just, bloomed up? I was, as, I was as tall as I am now, but I was about 180 pounds. I yeah, wasn't yeah. small, but I didn't stand out really good or really bad at anything. So I was right in the comfortable spot, like right in the middle. Gray guy. Yeah. Like it. Yeah. I was, I was right in the middle until the time I, until I unked on the rifle range. Ooh. Oh yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, I owned. I uh, paid too much. I was too much in my head. Paid too much attention to the scorecard. Mm-hmm. Didn't trust a zero on my rifle. I thought I knew better. All the horror stories you hear about, you know, shooting. Yeah. So then I had to go back and shoot the next week. With a much smaller amount of recruits, I assume? No, because they put you on the next company coming through oh. with some of the drill instructors from the company that you're in. Oh, good. But I got put on a range with a girl company. Horrible. Bad, bad move? Horrible, right? Like, <laughs> not great. You can't look around. They're, and uh, the women drill instructors are worse than the guys. Yeah, I've heard that. Oh, so... I quali- ended up qualifying like on Wednesday. I got out of there, went back to team week, right? Got out of boot camp. Everything's great. Everything's gravy. You know, the pride, chest stuck out like Marine, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So went home on boot leave and then uh, went to School of Infantry. You it. <laughs> yeah. You it. You it. School of Infantry is a good place. I-, I appreciated it more as an instructor than as a student, obviously. But yes. like there are some of the in my experience, there was some of the greatest Marines. Like when I went through SOI, I had guys that just came home from Phantom Fury. No, that's not true. Fallujah one. And some of the Ramadi, uh, some of the Ramadi Marines, Oh three Ramadi, Oh four Ramadi Marines. And I, I appreciate that. I appreciated that because, um, they weren't our drill instructors and they didn't treat us like that. But they knew where we were going, and so the training was like on and popping. So I always appreciated the guys over at SOI. Yeah, I didn't have that. I had a bunch of guys that came in in 93, 94. So peacetime instructors. <clears throat> yeah, but there were a lot of young, hungry NCOs mm-hmm. that didn't want to be drill instructors, mm-hmm. and they had to find somewhere else to go. Mm-hmm. One of my SOI instructors I still talk to to this day um, – I think he's on the close combat lethality task force still. Okay. Right. So he was my SOI instructor, and I ran into him some years later. He was a master sergeant. I was a I was a staff sergeant in TBS. I immediately remembered this guy. I remembered him because of the patience and the empathy that he had, and really trying to teach us. Mm-hmm. Instead of just talking at us and calling us stupid, mm-hmm. that guy put effort even as a sergeant in teaching us. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name is Bo Hornsby. Um, I hope out. he's okay. I hope he's okay for with me. Like saying his name on here, try not to mention names, kind of guys are cool with it. But that guy is amazing. Oh yeah, shout out. And uh, and so that guy, I remembered him, and um, he's one of the ones that I remembered the whole time. And uh, so then we graduated SOI, and that's when I met my first platoon sergeant. Who's that? A guy named John Daly. He's retired now. He's a retired gunner. Um. SOI graduation day, we feel like we made it. We're about to be fleet marines. You know, like every <laughs> every step you go through, like the infamous the the next step is the infamous fleet, the yep. infamous, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, right? Like yep. boot camp. Oh, SOI. You know, SOI like oh, the fleet. Yep. Oh man, I'm gonna wear green skivvy shirts now because that's what guys in the fleet wore. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, you wear green or brown. But guys in the fleet wore green. <laughs> so, so we were excited. It's like that boot camp too, like no boot blouse. <laughs> yeah. Blouse your boots. Yeah. Roll your sleeves. Guys that were two weeks ahead of you, are like, man, they're so salty. Hey, look how sharp they are. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. But, so dumb. Yeah, but it gives you something to look forward to. So uh, we graduated. Yeah, if that's how you piecemeal your day yeah. up, man. Then. So we graduated in camis, and then there was four of us going to this company, and all of us in the same platoon on November 4th of 1999. Oh, good it was impressionable a day it was on a you. Thursday. <laughs> Anybody that's listening that doesn't know, Thursday in Marine Corps is field, field day. day. Pick a corner in your room and start cleaning because yeah. it's never going to be good enough. They don't really do that anymore, but that was a that was a very not the way that we did it. No, that's you know, and I don't even. I think it's probably better. As much as I hate saying that, and I don't want soft Marine Corps, but it's, it you shouldn't be hazing the dudes that are you know potentially going to be the ones pulling you out of a shit situation yeah i think so. there's a happy meeting with it though, i do right? think there's like a happy there's, meeting there's, there's a happy 100 percent. so this guy came out and this did you have the happier medium no or? no I, I didn't a complete extreme um this guy came out with like two lance corporals and we were pfcs and uh this guy came out and he stands there and he's like and he stands in front is john daly this little five foot seven psychotic blue eyes 
and he didn't blink the whole time. And he gave us <laughs> two and a half minutes to change from camis into alphas and have all of our stuff out by the vehicles that he had, like Humvees outside for us yeah. to ride in to go check into one six. Hell yeah. So we're like, oh my God, this, like, we're getting counted down. This continues. Like, we thought we were past, we're, we're in the fleet. We're past this. No, I thought this was going to no, be no, the we, fun part. We were not past it. So we change in alphas, get everything loaded up, and check into Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 6 Marines on November 4th, 1999, on a Thursday. By the time we got everything done to the company office and you didn't have IPACs or anything else, everything you needed was in a battalion. Mm -hmm. From dental to medical to admin, everything was in the battalion. Mm -hmm. So he took us through all of that stuff and uh, took us up to the barracks and told us to pick a corner and start cleaning. Oh, that's what he really said to you. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, like, they start cleaning. We're like, oh, we know how to clean. Like, you don't know, you don't know anything about cleaning. And we're like... So, and even if you know a little bit about yeah, cleaning, this ain't the kind of cleaning you've done. No. <laughs> so I just happened to be in a room by myself. Oh, good. So I was the only one standing inspection. Nobody that had been there for even a few months to help me out. So I cleaned for like an hour. I'm like, that's good. Um, that Lance Corporal, that fire team waiter, he came in and tore me up. <laughs> <laughs> and had to start all over. And... I had to carry everything outside, like that's where you emptied your room. Chinese right? food, oh, yeah. horrible. Or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so it was so bad. And we finally got done field day in about one or two in the morning, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then we had a five o'clock, you know, zero five reveille to get ready for a company inspection. And um, normally, daily would come around about one or two in the morning, and if you passed your field day inspection, he took your room key. And that platoon bivouacked in front of the barracks every Thursday night. Oh, if you passed, so you wouldn't if mess you it back yeah, up? That's right. <laughs> you, had to, you had to have your sleeping bag if it was cold, right, under your arm. And you had to have, like, a canteen and, like, your razor in your pocket because you were dry shaving in the morning. Oh, good. Fun stuff. So, so about... about but your room's clean. Yeah, about zero one, zero two, maybe 3, if he was mad. He came by and he would pass your room. And then you got like two hours of sleep in front of the barracks while everybody else is in their rooms. And uh, then the company would come through field day inspection. Okay, you failed. You're getting reinspected in the mm -hmm. morning. You failed. And I have to tell you, like a lot of people have problems with the way daily did, but I know one thing. Rooms were clean. Friday, I was getting secured for the weekend. Yeah. There was plenty of times that entire company was refield day in the barracks on Saturday morning and being inspected, not third platoon. Yeah, I'm betting not. You were the only platoon that would do that? Yeah. Okay. And and that was just daily standard. And I just carried that forward and daily like broke one platoon commander's leg, broke another's neck. We didn't have a platoon commander for long. We went through platoon commanders like tea bags. How did he break them? Well, that's the, that platoon PT was daily <laughs> and the lieutenant sprinting, sprinting, oh, sprinting. sprinting for 30 minutes. Then you'd fight, you'd ground fight, and then you sprint back for 30 mm. minutes. That was platoon PT every day. Get some. And daily would fight, and daily would Fuck break, people break, up. <laughs> yeah, break lieutenants. And, um, and I remember the first time they found out, like, I was like an all conference wrestler, like, conference champion. And they, uh, they had third platoon, first platoon PT. They had third platoon versus weapons platoon. They gave me this big corporal from weapons, and I just threw him around. Just ragdolled him. Yeah, and they were like, "Oh, I like this guy." So <laughs> I was, I was, I was in good with Daly at that point. Kudos. Yeah, like yeah. I was, in, I was in good with him when he was. He was one of those guys. Like he had a high standard of discipline. Looking back at what I retired as, um, he had a high standard of discipline and a high level of proficiency. Like, that is what you want in a platoon sergeant. Mm -hmm. We went to the field. You could not mess with him in mm -hmm. tactics or anything else. Mm -hmm. But then the high standard of discipline in the rear. Like, both areas, that platoon was, like, solid. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that at that time, right? And I, my squad leader hated my guts. A guy named Brian Smith. Like, he's a cop now. He's been out for a long time. But uh, he hated my guts. I don't know why. Probably because Daly liked me because a lot of guys didn't like him. Mm -hmm. But I ended up little by little winning him over. And that's when I started to learn like, okay. Prof you mean your squad leader? Yeah. Uh -huh. So proficiency will win people over. You just try to learn and try to do your job and try to do the best right. that you can. And uh, I had problems with roommates. 
roommates would be drunk and I was 18. Like I was like, I don't want to get in trouble. Like I wasn't drinking in the barracks. I'm like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so I had problems with roommates. Eventually I would get roommates and I remember one provoked me a little bit too much and got hurt. I I bounced him off the walls (laughs) and then the same roommate, like a month or so later, like he got in, in Corporal Smith's face. I'm like, well, I don't care if he likes me or not. It's my squad leader. And I took him and I choke slammed him. Pop, pop. Yeah. Just undertaker choke slam in the middle of the room. Um, I didn't even hit him. I just, just joke slam and he was unconscious. Did he make that mistake anymore? No. No. <laughs> and they moved him to a different room. It's wild and, how those things work, <laughs> yeah. man. And, uh, they moved him to a different room. It was the second time I'd bounced him off the walls and stuff. So, but then after that, Smith kind of liked me. Mm-hmm. I wish he, that would have happened before we went out to Cax and 29 Palms cause he hated me then. So I had to dig fighting holes in rocks. Yeah. That can boulders. be bad when you're not liked. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. a bad place to not be late. Yeah, it's horrible. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that went into our first workup for my first deployment, which was a UDP to Okinawa, and that was in 2000. Under, with Charlie 1-6. Charlie 1-6. Charlie 1-6, check. Yep. And, da- and Daly is your platoon sergeant for that, too? Nope. So or he, he got, he, so he, so Daly, <laughs> Daly had one of those things where I'm really good, so you can't tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, like, one morning when he was the platoon commander, the company commander we had, who again didn't deploy with us because not daily, but somehow I think it was on a run or whatever, he broke his ankle. So we okay. had a company commander. But this company commander was platoon commanders, you know, bringing in. And this guy never came out to company formation, it was always the first sergeant. Mm-hmm. The company commander was never there. Mm-hmm. So then modern day people would be like, why, what are you there? Like leadership. Blah, blah, blah. And like, at the time, you didn't even see staff and COs during the day. It was only sergeants and right. corporals that led you around, right? That's right. all you saw. Yeah. So. <laughs> This guy was like, well, first platoon, what are you doing? We're going to do this, 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 and then we're going to wind up with this. No, you're not. You're going to do this. Second platoon, same thing. Nope, you're not going to do that. You're going to do this. Staff sergeant, what are you doing? Well, we're going to run, then we're going to fight, and we're going to run back. And he's like, what makes you think you can have these Marines fight each other? He's like, how about I kick your ass and I'll, you'll understand. To the company commander as a staff sergeant. <laughs> How'd that go? I I don't I don't know, but the first sergeant pulled him in the company office. It didn't go in front of y'all. <laughs> nope, it didn't go in front of us. But before he went in the company office, he turned around. He's like, "Don't move." We're like, we "Stay right there." Like, we're, we ain't moving. We ain't moving. Jet. So he went in the company <laughs> office, and whatever happened in there, don't know. Didn't get the live play by play. All I know is he came back out. And we ran and we fought and we ran back. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Staff right. Sergeant, if you undermine me in front of the men again. Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah, so, we're going for a run. <laughs> then we're going to fight. Yep. And then we're going to go for a run. Yep, that's exactly what happened. But uh, they kind of moved him before the deployment to a FAP over to the range. Okay. And uh, we got back, and they moved him over to 81s to be a section leader. And, you know, we started the next workup, right, when I was a squad leader. I started being a squad leader as like a Lance Corporal. Mm-hmm. And at the time, it was much like it is now. It was uh, it was 18 months in between deployments. Yeah, long time. So, yeah, you got back, and you were kind of stood Which down. Which is for, great, but... Yeah, it can be, but then at the time it was expected, right? Mm. Now these guys grow up and the senior most people are the ones like us that went through the heavy operational tempo in the early and mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. Like you're over for six to nine, you're back for three or four, over for six to nine, and you're, you're just gone so much. Tempo up, yeah. Yeah, so now guys are like, what are we doing? And now the these these young cats that come into these infantry battalions are expecting this fast tempo, well, what are we hurrying for? Mm-hmm. Why can't we take our time? Why can't we remediate things when you have more than enough time to do so? Sure. You know, so so we had the next workup. I was a squad leader through the whole time. Um, deployed as a squad leader in June of 02. Like we were at Bridgeport when September 11th happened. Oh, um, we'll talk about that a little bit. Does did what was that experience? Did you get to see anything, or were you, so you're in Bridgeport? So you're training. So I was in, I was in Bridgeport, and uh, we were on Advon. There was a group of the NCOs that that the company put in um, to go to a salt climbers course. Okay. One of the two courses I went to, I never I didn't graduate. <laughs> <laughs> I got dropped from it. Oh um, man. Yeah, which was, I heard it's a it's a course. Well, I'm definitely afraid of heights. Well, it doesn't help in that course. <laughs> it doesn't. Not, not good. Right. So it's uh. So we go up there, Advon, and we go through learning the rope systems. We test out with the rope system, right? Like the one by nine bridge took me three times to to pass it. Mm. And so I'm kind of lagging behind some of the other guys that are really catching on to this stuff. Mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. So the battalion hasn't even left Lejeune yet, and actually the main the main body of uh, 
one six was in the air on September of eleventh. And they got grounded in, uh, I think it was Salt Lake City. Somewhere in Utah, they got grounded for like two days before oh, the wow. FAA would even let military flights fly. So we're getting, we're falling out of the barracks. One of the few nights we actually slept in a bed during a salt climbers course. We're getting out of the barracks. We're getting mm-hmm. ready to head up to the training area to do our climbs for the day. And uh, we're going to breakfast and we hear something about a plane hitting the World Trade Center. We don't have, there's no cell phones at the time. There's no, you know, yeah, yeah. none of that. We're just getting this these rumors like a plane hit, and we thought it was like a drunk pilot, like, like everybody else thought, yeah, small thought Cessna it, or yeah, something. Some we didn't know was as bad it was. So we go to Chow Hall, we go up to the training area, and like midday through the training area, it's like everybody pack up your stuff, load up in the vehicles now. We're gone. Mm-hmm. So they take us back down to the the main camp at uh, at Bridgeport, like Pickle Meadow, and uh, they take us into the theater and they play them start playing news clips. And we're like, what? Like what is going on right mm-hmm. now? And um, all we know is one eight or one six is stuck in Utah. We are in Bridgeport. We don't know what's going to happen. The regimental commander of six Marines at the time wants his entire regiment back in case we need to deploy as a regiment. Right. Right. So there is a couple days going back and forth. Are we going to do this training or not? And uh, it ends up we we do the training. We go through Bridgeport the entire time as a battalion. Um, I think it was, well, two companies. I think we'll come, one company coming in and my company was getting ready to go out. I was still in Assault Climbers. Is we listened to President Bush's address mm-hmm. like a few days later, mm-hmm. right? And um, and so we're getting ready for this. Like, But it's a perfect place for a battalion to be at mountain warfare training yeah. if we're going to go in Afghanistan. Yeah. So we go through the whole thing. And that's when 3-6 ended up going to Afghanistan. They were the only battalion that went in. Mm. Um, at the time, they spent a... They spent a Quite a long time. I can't say if it was a full six months. I don't remember. I believe it was a full six months living in the defense. Mm-hmm. Um, and those guys came back with cars, and they thought they were the king of the 2nd Marine Division. I think they were <laughs> the king of the 2nd Marine Division well, they at were the, the time, weren't they? they? They were the only ones walking around with cars, I can tell you that. Right? That's right. <laughs> and so when it comes to an infantryman, only t- only two two ribbons mean anything. A car mm-hmm. and a sea service deployment. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, if you have them, but how many do you have? Mm-hmm. And, that's, and that's your juice. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, cock of the walk coming home from that. That's right, right. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, so in June of '02, we deploy to Okinawa again, mm. and uh, my platoon and the weapons platoon that we had in Charlie Company One Six got redeployed to Bahrain. Okay, to stand security and naval logistics ships. And that was my first mission under OEF. Okay. Uh, so like my ship that I was on with a, with a small debt of Marines, like, you know, as a squad, mm-hmm. uh, we were doing security on, on a, um, the Walter S deals, USNS ship, right? So it was okay. a tanker, okay. right? That was up in the Gulf and then out in the Indian ocean in the Red Sea, uh, doing underway replacements for like Muse that would come into sure. later. And that was my first trip under OEF. Oh yeah. And does the, the does that de- deployment kind of close out with that mission or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were we were at sea for four months. Um, the whole thing was just be a hard target, right? So yeah, yeah. What did you do? What, what I mean, you got a small um, a small augment. So we got a small debt. So what I had was two two forties on the bow of the ship, two fifty cows on the stern, and we had fields of fire where they could overlap. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it was it was basically anti piracy. Yeah. So the fast movers and the small fishing boats, so nobody could sneak up and yeah. you know and 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 coal the ship, right? That's kind of like, like marine marine work, right there. It though. is right. Like so it was going it was going marine. back to the original mission of the Marine Corps. So that was kind of our legacy, and, and people were excited to do it, right? Mm-hmm. Going from a peacetime military into a wartime military, this was our first shot. It's doing something real. Yeah, yeah. Right, real world things. Now, did you have any piracy issues or any small fast movers uh, come up on you, or anything like that? Yeah, but they were all like. Like the, the Persian Gulf is, is full of smuggling lanes, right? So no one was trying to get into us. They're just smuggling things through the lanes in the Persian Gulf. Yeah. So we had some we had some, you know, high tension times, but no one tried to to bomb us. Um, you know, there was like a French freighter that got blown up in the Persian Gulf okay. uh, the summer of O two. Okay. And like we were the original target, right? But we just tried to make ourselves hard to kill. So we pull into port, we would have, you know, uh, seaside security where local nation, like the host nation police would yep. have pier side security. Yeah. And so when we were in port, we'd have guys walking, you know, seaside. And occasionally I just have them drop concussion grenades in the water, you know, in case they were divers. I wouldn't uh, even have thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> and so we had a react room where people would come out and they, you know, we, uh, we were a bunch of young guys on the ship 
you know, at first my platoon commander was out with us. Then it turned into my platoon sergeant was out with us. You know, we were making our way. It it got real boring at times. Now, this is 2002 mm-hmm. time frame. Mm-hmm. And did uh, did anything come over to you guys uh, from the the incident at Falaka Island? No, I don't remember that. So it was like a, a pickup truck full of, um, not full, like it had three guys in it, ambushed a marine uh, element training on the island. I had um, I had a gentleman on that was running for the school board, yeah. uh, retired gunny, come on and talk about it. And I'm like, dude, I've never even heard of yeah, of that. And then I started doing some research. Yeah, it's crazy. It's not ringing a bell. 2002, yeah. Anyway, no. <clears throat> but but I knew that was going on in the area at the time. So that's that's a pretty wild mission, though. And like, I know maybe some of the Raiders do that now and uh, mm-hmm. and, and have some security bubbles that they put around shipping lanes and, yeah. and definitely ship it. That's like a romantic mission to me as far as like old school Marine Corps mission. Yeah, know? right. So, I mean, the, what we call VBSS now, like, um, you know, that, that vessel-borne search and seizure mm. mission, um, if I have the V right, it, uh, we had that mission, right? If we had calls to, we would take a, take a, you know, a boat from the board ship and, and board a ship. And we never had to do that, but we were prepared to do it. Yeah. And we were just figuring it out. Yeah, man. All right. So yeah, we were just did you sea. train for that? No. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to no. say. You didn't tr- have any training for... No. We had a staff sergeant that a few years prior, and this was like a terminal staff sergeant, a great dude um, named Payne. He had done something similar to that a couple of years prior. So all we had is his suggestions going into it, mm. you know, how to react and where to put things and, and stuff like that, right? So it's... Um, Figuring it out. We just We just figured it out. And uh, it it was it was an okay time. I didn't. That wasn't my that wasn't my best showing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, as far as like messing up ammo counts and stuff, I you know it's that was I was like twenty years old. These things happen. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I was a corporal, but I was an SOG, and you know stuff like that. Like yeah, I, yeah. looking back, I've been like, yeah, you're dumb. You could have done that a lot better. But you know, we we live and we learn. Yeah, yeah. We got back to Okinawa in November, and uh, I thought it was I thought it was hot shit because uh that was the month that the national defense medal was authorized okay during that deployment i got my good cookie and then we were coming back with an armed forces x uh, armed forces expeditionary got medal. some stacks going yeah you right little, so I, all of a sudden stack. i went from a sea service deployment ribbon as a corporal to being a sergeant because i got promoted that november to being a sergeant with three like one one row going on second, I was like, "This is this is hot shit, right? Like, this is That's this awesome is stuff, though. right? Yeah. I can join the VFW now. Like, this is all the things <laughs> that we're going to do." But we also knew that the the buildup was happening. Yeah, it's not know, over in, in Kuwait. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was over. Oh, you like, thought it was over? Yeah. I, thought, think- I, this is my second deployment. I get out in June. Stop oh, loss hadn't happened pl- yet. Yep. Yeah. I was not reenlisting, and uh, we get back from that deployment in December, and uh, the buildup's happening. We're like, "Well, you guys, we we." all of us salty guys, you know, we got six months left. We take all young guys like this is going to be you guys. Like you better, yep. you better get ready. Get ready. Mm-hmm. And we were like, yeah, we trained the guys that went. That's going to be our contribution. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> On the contrary. <laughs> On the contrary. Um, in late February, we got a phone call. Uh, I was living in an apartment with a buddy of mine. Like we were living it up six months left. Short timers. Oh yeah. Star squad. Yeah, no, we, um, we got a phone call about, about midnight, there's a staff sergeant in the company. This guy's like, hey, first sergeant's upstairs, the sergeant major, burning midnight oil. I know what it's about, but stand by. We're like, oh, shit. Goody. <laughs> like, oh, man. And um, we don't, we don't, we're on air alert. Got put so on we, st- we still have, no, we, oh, we, you we're, already on it. Oh, Once shit. you come back from deployment, you go on leave, you come back from leave, you automatically go on like 30 days air alert, right? Okay. Where each okay. company had like an alpha increment where you were like head on four hour tether, if I remember right. Okay. So we were on air alert. And that's where you had like formations twice a day. Yep. Right. You had the, if you were going anywhere, if you lived off base, you were going anywhere you had to call the duty NCO, tell them where you were going and when you were going to be back and all these things. You Check. Permanent accountability. So about, about three thirty, four o'clock in the morning, get a phone call. Like, Hey, get in formation now. It doesn't matter what you're in. Mm-hmm. Well, this is, this is February of 03. Like it matters what you're in in formation. Yeah. <laughs> like, and to be told it doesn't matter what you're dressed in, like, this is pretty important. There's something urgent going down. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the whole company comes out, and they come out with a roster, and they start reading off names. <laughs> 
And uh, I was like, oh shit, these are all my buddies. And all of a sudden they read my name. I'm on this list. <laughs> yeah. So they read my name and I was like, and they didn't tell us what the names were for. So they read my name. I'm like, oh, okay. We kind of knew it was for, but we didn't know what it was for. Yeah. So they get us all in a group. Sergeant's over here. Corporal's over here. Take the corporals off and talk to them. And then take the sergeants off and talk to them. In my company, there was like four or five sergeants. And uh, first sergeant pulls us in the office. He's like, all right, here's the deal. You're going to Iraq. <laughs> You've been stop lost. Is uh, that what he told you? Or is no, it just like, no, no you're going, we got This is up. when he told us about stop loss. Okay. So if I don't, if I remember this right, he's like, all right, you're going to Iraq. The Marine Corps right now is stop lost. Nobody gets out. Yeah. Nobody moves units. Mm -hmm. There are certain orders that can proceed, but you guys are not getting out. You're going to Iraq. And we're like, okay. That changes he's things. Like, <laughs> and he's like, in case any of you are cowards, I'm going to walk in my office for five minutes. And if you want to run, you're going to get a five-minute head start. And the guy <laughs> turns around and walks in his office and shuts the door. And we're standing around like we're all buddies. No one's running. You were scared. No, you were yeah, scared. Like we're, we're standing around. We're like, <laughs> shit. So we walk over to the door, knock on the door like, hey, man, no one's running. You want to come out and tell us what's going on? Like, mm -hmm. what do we need to do? Because mm -hmm. all of us are also like on cell phones, like girlfriends, like, hey, with like bad this, things, bad things. Like, hey, 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 like bad things, but we need to do good things before the bad things happen. Like, That's all right. these things, right? Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> so he comes out where to check out a one six that day. It's a Wednesday. We're to check out a one six and uh wait for orders okay so i've still got this platoon sergeant that hates my guts <laughs> and he's asking every step that i'm out like listen man i'm checking out of you like you do not control me right now off like, your roster big like daddy. you need to leave me alone bud mm -hmm. like i know where i'm going and i I'm, i was due to get out in four months but i guess that's not happening so like pound bricks like get yeah yeah so the next day on Thursday, we check into 2nd Marine Regiment. That's okay. all we knew, 2nd Marine Regiment. Mm -hmm. All right. And then they want to put us through like a PTP. We need to go to the gas chamber and zero rifles. Like and, all your annual stuff. Oh, yeah. Like mm -hmm. all that stuff in like a day. Mm -hmm. And that was on Friday. Fun Friday. Yeah. So they take us out, go to the gas chamber. Then we go. There's, there's 26 sergeants that were going to 3 2. Okay. And the rest of the corporals, I forget the, 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 the number of corporals, but they were going to two six. Okay. And two six was going to be security for the IMF headquarters, right? Okay. So one MEF headquarters. So the 26 sergeants were going to three, two. We didn't know we were going to three, two. All we know is we're a second Marine regiment. We got to go to the gas chamber. We got to do this, but we also want time off because all of the girlfriends and wives are in town. Sure. And, uh, so these, we're going to go zero rifles. Hey, we have rifles that are zeroed in one sixes armory. Why don't we just go take those? We're like, that's a great idea. So like, I don't remember paperwork being done, <laughs> Yeah. but we just walked over to the armory and drew our rifles out. And those were our rifles that we took into combat. And we put them in second Marine regiments like cage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, before we were released on Friday, after that day, they gave us smallpox and we we're like, Hey, we got girlfriends and wives in town. Is this <laughs> like, can't you give us this? Like when we're at like, when we're Cherry, not going to have contact with them anymore. Yeah, when we're at Cherry point and no one's going to touch it. They're like, Nope, got to get it now. Okay. Yeah. So we, uh, and my, my wife had just left the Lejeune area mm -hmm. from a, from a long weekend. And, uh, she turned right back around and was like right back there. You know, I think it was early Thursday morning when I and called so her. And you're already Wednesday. married at this point. I checked. Uh, yeah. Like we're, we're together. Right. So she came right back around and came right back down and my parents came down and we have these people waiting on us. Mm -hmm. And when we got released on Friday, we're on a four hour tether. Yep. Right. So we're on a four hour tether. And when we get a phone call, we're on a plane in four hours. Yep. And, um, so Saturday morning. No, early Sunday morning, like Saturday night, early Sunday morning, the wife took off. She went back to Indiana and my parents took off like Sunday afternoon. Two hours after my parents took off, we got the phone call and Sunday night we we're on a plane into Kuwait mm -hmm. and we get into Kuwait and we mess around for a couple of days because nobody knew, no one was expecting us. Nobody knew where we were going. And finally we found our own ride to uh, Camp Buring. And to the unit we were supposed to go to. And the, I remember the battalion commander coming in with the sergeant major. And there's 26 sergeants standing there. Oh, Mad. you mean it's U-26 that went out yeah. together. Okay. So this battalion commander comes in. We're mad. We're pissed off. Um, we don't know anything that's going on. 
And he's like, all right, hey, welcome to the unit, yada, yada, yada. Is there any questions? We're like, yeah, what battalion is this? Yeah. Yeah, like, where are we? What, <laughs> yeah. Who are we attached like, to? Yeah. What are we doing? And he's like, oh, three, two. Okay. So I got put with Lima Company. <laughs> I was and, in uh, Lima. Yeah, uh, yeah Lima, third platoon, right? And so uh, for the invasion. And okay. um, so we got put with Lima Company. I was heavily encouraged because I walked into the tent that I was going to sleep in that night, and there was no cots. So we were sleeping on the sand, which Sweet. means we're not going to be here long. Yeah. It's great. Short time. But the next morning, I saw two of my best friends, right? A guy named Levi Pfeiffer and Brian Albin that uh, were in the same company. And that was that was a blessing, right? Yeah. Because like yeah. we had grown up together since we were PFCs. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So I saw them. and They I, were I, already I, there? No, in, no, no. They came in with us. In, but, okay. but as they called off names, you left the tent. Check. So I didn't know who was in the same company. Yeah, but yeah. It was, it was Levi and Brian. And uh, a few days later, we uh, went and staged on the border. And it was crazy. We staged in three clicks south of the border the night before we crossed, seeing. Uh, Are you in like skirmishers? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, skirmishers, trenches, and seeing the tomahawks mm -hmm. come south to north mm -hmm. and the scuds come north to south, like the Patriot batteries firing all yep. night long. Yeah. Like getting the, the gas, 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 like the yep. signal to put on a gas mask multiple times that night. So I just said to hell with it and put on my gas mask, went to sleep. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, Catch some Z's, baby. Like, yeah, I'm just going to sleep in this thing tonight. That's and we funny. woke up and crossed the border. Yeah. And you're not crossing on foot, though, are you? No, no, no. We're in back trucks. to seven tons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unarmored. Sandbags in the bottom. Of yeah. The <laughs> not up armored. No, not up uh, armored. Honeycomb steel that we like now. Sa sandbags in the bottom. No canvas covering. It's like straight generation kill style yes. like the guys if, if any of you've watched generation kill these guys are putting sandbags on their floors and they were putting um they had like those armor jackets a lot of guys would talk about putting those in the floors because it's like yep they weren't facing rounds up here nope. they were facing explosions yep. down here i've talked to a lot of guys that had like uh stories where when when the when that first push started to go down uh, they tell me that, like, I don't know why I did it that day, but we put extra sandbags in the back mm -hmm. and then it happened to be the day they needed them, you know, kind of thing. So. And so at the time, the IEDs weren't a thing. Right, right. It right. was, at it that was time, minefields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we were worried about mines and, yeah. and Saddam's minefields. Right. But uh, we started to fight north. And I remember one night, it was like three or four days into now, this. Now, now, now kind of run, run me through that. You crossed the border. You're just driving essentially, yeah. right, online with a big unit until you reach friction? Or a choke point? Uh, no, we're driving in line. These yeah. these convoys that stretch for miles. I mean, thousands of vehicles in yeah. this movement. Yeah. And uh, we're just driving. We drive for so long, and they would stop because the drivers would need rest. So we'd just hop out and we'd set defensive positions. Mm -hmm. And uh, they the drivers would rest or change out drivers or go back in and, and drive north. And you're just in the back of these trucks. All day. And it's not comfortable for anybody no, that's not been in a Humvee it, or a seven ton. It's not comfortable. It, and the moon dust over there is horrible for guys in the backs of the truck. And the guys try to be like, oh, we got we to gotta sit back to back facing outboards 10 minutes in the drive. It is just strewn out. Like yeah, you just yeah. throw, if you just threw, you know, bodies in the back and they're just stacked on top of each other because everybody's asleep. We, we tried to have like one awake in case something was going to happen. Um, you just try to find a, a comfortable place where you could just smoke cigarettes and kind of enjoy the scenery. Yeah. Um, and there was a couple times that, and, and it was weird because we got to see Saddam's IO campaign up, up front and personal Yeah. because we stopped by his village. Obviously the village is like 150 meters away. We needed to go clear it. We had to make sure nobody was there during the stop. Yeah. So the company commander, you know, called me over. He's like, grab a squad and go clear that. And so we started clearing it, but they had just been rocketed, um, from Saddam you know, a couple of days prior. So they, they were telling us like, yeah, we got uncle Bob buried in the living room Yeah, and he might be poking up now. And so we busted down these doors cause they told us they're like, listen, we don't have, you know, locks for these. So we don't have keys. Like just kick the door in the people were, were hard up. They were poor, they were starving, but they mm -hmm. were very, they were nice. Mm -hmm. They were not combative. Mm -hmm. We tried to help them as best we could. And but at they, that point you hadn't met any of the Republican no, like no, no, no. The, the we defenders had, yet? No, we had not seen combat at this point. Check. So what they had told us was, well, we were asking, trying to ask what happened. 
And they told us that they that we had just rocketed them. Like, we didn't rocket you. Mm-hmm. And that's when, oh, Saddam is rocketing his own people and then telling them that the U.S. had done it to yeah. get people to rise up Propaganda against us. Propaganda campaign. Yep, that's yeah, right. Man. That's what he was doing. And Smart. so Smart. It, it, was, it was a horrible, horrific sight in that village. They were living... Man, they were already in horrible circumstances, let alone the village getting rocketed. It was it was not great. And then you hit we, them with gas or regular no no just rockets munitions. just yeah. And so we loaded up and we left and we went north and eventually, um, and Nazaria kicked off. We got called in at Nazaria. Yeah, I want to talk about that. All right, so you come in, uh, you you do the push. You coming in and the first real choke point, let's say. No, it it wasn't the first one, right? So we were. Kind of a little far back. I was with Task Force Tarawa, right okay. in the second map. Mm-hmm. So, I believe it was, it was the third ID that pushed through, pushed through Nazaria. And uh, we were, at the time, we were unaware of uh, the, the lost convoy, the uh, Jessica, Jessica Lynch, Lynch. convoy. Yeah. We were unaware that that had happened. As, as it did, I think we knew some people were missing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, like, our awareness was very low, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So people got to remember in 2003, we don't have near the technology that we yeah. have now, right? Yeah. We, we're all working off of like, you know, green gear radios, stuff that's getting, you know, passed around, you know, some of the information is not complete, some it's mm. not accurate. So we knew that a convoy was lost, but the third idea pushed through. And then, um, one, two, 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 a, bat- a Marine battalion pushed in, right? Mm-hmm. And um, they were gonna they were ambushed right. So You're talking south about the in, bridge. into into the bridge area. Yeah, yeah. Okay. right. So several friends that were there, that battalion, um, you know, they got hit and they got hit hard, mm-hmm. right? And they had a lot of combat. J.D. LeHue, right, was a platoon sergeant with the AAVs in that battalion. He received a Navy Cross, mm-hmm. right? Eventually for this, I got another buddy. Um, <clears throat> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, and I may be. Didn't the army try to go up and across the bridge and got like into into a real ferocious, like just a bad fight, and then the marine battalion came up afterwards to aid that? It was my understanding that the army pushed through unmolested. Okay, okay. And kind of said the city was clear. And then the army. And then the okay. marines pushed the marines in and pushed. got ambushed. Like the army kicked up the hornet's nest. The marines walked into the hornets. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I refuse to read books and stuff about Anazaria because I lived it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even though my limited visibility, because I was I was a platoon guide at the time. Sure. My limited visibility wasn't very far, but I lived that city. I lived the fighting through that city and what we what we did to uh, accomplish the mission and survive. Mm-hmm. So you know that that city at the time was the first major battle of the you know what the time we were calling the second gulf war we didn't even know OE, oif was a thing we didn't, right. we didn't understand what operation iraqi freedom was never heard the phrase mm-hmm. so we were we were pushing through one two i believe it is and jd is going to kill me that i'm i'm kind of forgetting the number of this battalion but i know what the guys did mm-hmm. uh jd i'm sorry man if you hear this <laughs> i apologize shout out oh uh, yeah well jd he was a great man um and so they fought through, they got hit hard. And our original mission was a relief in place of that battalion. Uh-huh. And uh, I don't want to keep saying the numbers because it was the one, two or two, two. JD can kill me later. So, <laughs> so, um, so we were supposed to push up mm-hmm. and we got our order and we were going to get pushed up, walk, you walk forward by artillery and relieve them in place so they can get out. As we loaded up the trucks to go in and as we, our mission to change, we were supposed to go to a separate part of the city. And relieve the pressure on them so they can solidify okay. the lines and, and, you know, kind of keep fighting. And we did. And we pushed through and um, pushed in the city. We were clearing the city down, came upon a, a Bath Party headquarters, right? And so did a company attack on the Bath Party headquarters. Mm-hmm. Um, my job with one of the squads and the platoon that I was in, 3rd Platoon 3-2, was to cut a path across I-95. Okay. Yeah, right? it's going through and Nazaria. Yeah. So I was to take half a squad and block, put a blocking position in. The squad leader's taking the other half a squad to put a blocking position and create a tunnel so we could cross, the, the rest of the company could cross this, you know, expressway mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, get into the headquarters. Well, we did. And uh, 
So we went out and, and fired on the first vehicle that charged us. And uh, that vehicle stopped. And right then and there, I set the trigger line. It was about 150 meters in front of us. I was like, guys, any vehicle passes that, and you, you light it up. Yeah, yeah. Right? And we were there for hours because they attacked the Bath Party headquarters, exploited the site, everything that we needed to do. And you're holding to make sure nobody's backfilling or reinforcing why they're doing that. That's right. Yeah. Right. And, and to give them a you know an egress route off the objective. Sure. Right. So mm-hmm. we were just holding that. And we were there all day, and there were cars stacked up, and, you know, we didn't know near at the time what we know now about, you know, the culture, mm-hmm. right? So there were some mistakes made, but, you know, it was a mission that we need, that needed to get done. Sure. And uh, it was like one of those things, like, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So, mm-hmm. you know, we held the position, um, fired a lot of rounds, had some rounds shot back at us, but, you know, fired a lot of rounds. And uh, we, we maintained you know, the egress route and we, we maintained the tunnel. So after that, we went and set up shop, but it was, we didn't know what a fob was then. That term wasn't around in the Marine Corps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah. weird, right? Yeah. Like, fob wasn't a thing. Yeah. So we set, we, we ended up, you know, demoing a hole in the wall of a school and we set up that as a fob, as a cop, as a patrol base. Mm-hmm. All these terms that we have now that are just prevalent throughout the Marine Corps infantry <laughs> weren't even around then. This is our right? place. Yeah, patrol. This is our firm yeah, base. Yeah, patrol base was around, but it was a different type of patrol base than what we were doing. And yeah. we based operations out of that for the next month. Okay. You know, a month, 30 and days. Now, a school's a pretty good, I mean. Yeah, it was a pretty at good least spot. In, yeah, at least there. Yeah, the we, school we, there created, were not we, we created positions around it for security. And so at that point, we went into uh, clearing operations, right? Mm-hmm. So we were clearing hundreds of houses a day. Now, um, resistance? Uh, occasionally, Some. right? So, and, and that's the, that's probably the, the rough part of it. You could clear 50 houses and they're just deserted, but all of a sudden you run into a hornet's nest. Yeah, three block and, war, right? And then you, and you got to fight through that house. Mm-hmm. Um, it's co- you three know, we, block wars probably coined right around that time after. No, that was actually, was that after? It was well before that. Oh, was it before that? <laughs> yeah, well oh. before that. Okay. Yeah, well before. Well, at least it was for me, yeah. for, for me, it was all in experience. Iraq was, was was the three block when I started hearing yeah, about it. So. But it was but it was absolutely um the three block war put into reality. But yeah, that that, that term was coined well before the invasion. You say coined Iraq. coined well before but definitely implemented then. Yeah, it yeah. it was. So we uh, so we started clearing operations. We clear hundreds of houses a day and it got to the point to where, you know, everybody always wants to clear top down. Well at the, at that point we were trained. If you can get to the top, you clear top down. Yeah. Well, now we know there's pros and cons to both. Mm-hmm. And you got to do your analysis, like your quick met T of, is it better to clear top down? Can I get to the top? That's right. Because what don't you have from the top, right? Yeah, gravity works with you, but you don't have a Kazavac. Mm-hmm. You have to clear the objective. To you have to get down eventually. Right? Yeah. Yep. Right? You're not getting casualties out. So, um, so we started clearing up one, jumping roofs to the next house and clearing down the next mm-hmm. house. Mm-hmm. You know, everything that we could do. So... Um, so that's what we were doing. I mean, that's you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, and you're not always going to have access to the roof, yeah. and it's not always going to be a perfect no, situation. It's so, not, and and know. so we were, we were going through, and um, you know, the the guys that we were with, and the then and three two was comprised of a bunch of PFCs that spent about two weeks in SOI, mm-hmm. never graduated SOI, that battalion was not in a workup. Mm. And you want to talk about a greatest generation of the global war on terror. It was those guys that joined the Marine Corps probably June to August of 02 to go through boot camp and get into SOI in early 03 and then get walked in. Like they've been there for two weeks, done one field op and said that you're graduated. Here's your battalion assignments. Get to a bus. Mm-hmm. They get to a battalion gear thrown at them. They're thrown on a ship and floated over. Get so <laughs> right, like those guys that I did get that. It. I get yeah, it. Yeah, like like those guys that did that. I mean, they served four years in the Marine Corps and probably did four, six to nine month com- like combat deployments in their first four years. Yep, yep. You know, so like that was that was probably the greatest generation of the global war on terror. And you're transitioning the whole time. Yeah, like as a as an element as a Marine Corps. Yeah. So and you got to <laughs> kind of figure that new yeah. system. Out. I took. Uh, we took 10, 10 boots out of um, SOI maybe 12 days before we pushed yeah. into, or before we left for for margin 10. And those kids literally were PFC time and grade coming home. Yeah. With stacks. I'm telling you. 
trial by fire. Right. Literally. Bronze stars, so much Shit, silver stars, dude. right? That's where the leadership started to get jealous because they're the mm. staffies back in the COC. And That's they got, where like, it Lance started. Corporals, Lance Corporal's walking around with like silver stars. Lance um, Corporal Robert Kerman. Yeah, like that's where the car- Silver Star. That, that's where the Carcassian started to come in, and you get the random staffy out of the battalion staff to come to your patrol. You're like, go away. What are you doing <laughs> like, here? You're a liability right now. So, it's uh, all that started with the invasion of Iraq, and it just continued, mm-hmm. you know, throughout the 2000s, the 2010s. It was like, good lord. Even even once we'll get to it, you know, in Kabul. Uh, in Afghanistan, you had weird people show up at a gate that should not be there. Like, you need to go away because they're just looking for something. Trying to get it. Yeah. Trying Horrible. to chase it. Yeah. Not not good. Not great. It's not a good look on any of any of you. Because <laughs> it wasn't us. Any any of the staffies, right? Like That's, not, just, that's like, not a good look. Like and, and your Marines see it. And if you think they don't see it, they see yeah, it. You're like, wrong. And, and, and all those guys, like, I got what you're trying to do. You got a job to do. The Marine Corps needs you to do one thing. Go do that one thing. Go do that job so we can let do it, this one. Yeah, let us do our jobs, right? So, That's right. Yeah, yeah, that was we'll, that was at Nazaria. We'll get to the, we'll get to H Kaya. Yeah, we'll, on Nazaria, <laughs> man. I, that's um. So you're O three. Was it O three the beginning of that? O four. And Nazaria. Yeah. O three. It was 03. the first major battle of the the invasion in O yeah, three. Yep. Yeah. And I seen um that that's something that you know I can relate to because while you're in Nazaria doing that, I'm. I'm in my junior year, going yeah. into my senior year, watching the Tomahawks go yeah. off the ships and watching this shock and awe campaign yeah. kind of unfold, thinking, oh, is it still going to be there when I get out of school? Like, I feel like I'm going to miss it already, not yeah. knowing, ignorant maybe, or not thinking that my entire adult life, it wouldn't be over. I mean, um, there there are so many Marine Corps heroes that we have right now that without that push in Iraq, like, would we know their greatness, right? One, J.D. LeHue. <laughs> J.D. LeHue retires a 30-year sergeant major and now, now works for a historical society. Right now, he's working, walking across America, um, you know, to raise awareness for, uh, you know, missing in action. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? Like, he's been walking since the early summer. <laughs> Just um, getting after Yeah, him, he's man. walking the long road. I mean, like, J.D.'s a great man. And um, would we really know his? St- I, I I would think we would eventually, but without you know his story because he went back as a company first sergeant in Najaf mm. uh, with one four and received a bronze star for drawing sniper fire as a first sergeant. <laughs> right, like get after it. <laughs> it just he wasn't uh, just, done. Just an incredible guy, right? Another and guy, there's tons of them. This t- yeah, ton. Who else you got? Uh, another guy, John McCloskey, was actually in that ambush with the with the battalion, um, and he was a lad guy. Okay. And he received a bronze star with a V, you know, out of that action um, in Ann Nazaria. And no one would think a lad guy is like a guy that you lean on on combat, but John McCloskey's one of the ones to do it. I ended up mm. working with him later in my career at the Martial Arts Center, and uh, he's just a stand-up guy, just a, just a great human being. Yeah. Yeah, I say on the show a lot, um, my experiences as an infantryman and working uh, alongside, you know, and, and standing on the shoulders of giants – the combat um, element that comes from America, regardless of what branch it's in, are it's it's essentially a microcosm of the greatest beings, maybe that ever lived, but definitely that are in our nation at the time. Yeah, and it's when you're around that and you're inundated with that, that is such a great place to learn, grow up, look up to. And, uh, and that, that was my generation to you guys with that first generation coming through, like looking on the TV, seeing what we were going to be doing, seeing who our commands were going to be, where they came from. And it's huge. And it really is. There's such great people that have done great things that, uh, and that's another reason why I don't, you know, want to do this show is like, there's not enough people telling all these stories yeah. that could ever even come close to telling about all the great Americans that have put out for this country and put out in a time of need. So it's because we we never tell our own stories, right? We tell the stories of our guys. We tell the that's stories, right. and, and that's what I'm doing here too, right? Is to yep. display the you know the stories of of these young savages that we just served with, and all through the years throughout my entire career. Because since I retired in June, I've had time to reflect mm. on truly just the great youth that I was around and served with and worked for and, and, you know, they worked for me and it was just, it was a great time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, let's kick forward. Um, 
after on Nazaria, now you, now you've got some real combat. You've got some real trigger time, some real um, intense, let's say, uh, situations and events that have unfolded. You come back from that. Did did training mean something different to you when you came back from that? Well, so that's where we go into an interesting part. So after Ann Nazaria, we go to Alnumanium. We kind of do permanent bridge security, you know, ECP work on the south side of a bridge. Mm-hmm. And uh, we finish out, you know, the the invasion of Iraq then. Well, we get informed to give up our one sappy plate that we had. <laughs> <laughs> you really weren't. You really learned kind of who the questionable people were when they tried to put the sappy plate in the back <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so um we gave a sappy plate and we we kept one magazine mm-hmm. and we're like get out of here we're not like no we're keeping all of our ammunition because we were coming south yeah right so the ground war ended and the the grind will begin with iraq right um and kind of mid to late may oh no early may right early may so three twos one of the units coming out they got to get back on ship, float back home. Mm-hmm. But the 26 sergeants from 1-6, we could put on Advon. Because at the time, the Marine Corps is 35,000 overmanned. Stop loss is over. They got to get us out. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> we uh, so we catch the trucks. We drive south. We get back. Then we get divided up into Advon and the main body. The main body goes back to the ships in Kuwait. And Advon stays in Camp Earring. Mm-hmm. And we wait like four or five days on a flight back to the States. We get back to the States. We get a weekend off. They, there's some major tried to put us on duty that weekend, tried to put a duty roster together. We're like, get all the guys he doesn't know out of here. Right. Like, yeah, all, all the guys on the rear party try to put the combat vets coming back on duty that weekend. <laughs> but the company first sergeant we had was a great guy. Love the hell out of this dude. He had to go back on emergency leave. He had a family emergency. He had to come back and take care of. No qualms, no problems with him. He was a great man. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> he's on the airfield when we pull in. We're like, first sergeant, this major trying to put us on duty. He's like, no one's standing duty. You boys get your time off. We're nope. like, there we go. <laughs> he's like, if anyone's standing duty, it's me and that major. Yeah, right? yeah. We're like, there we go. That's our man. Our man, right? Yeah, yeah. Meeker. Got us. First sergeant Meeker. Okay. Great dude. Shout out. So so we get our weekend. We come back. We're like civilians within a week later. We go through like a so, like a two okay. hour taps. That makes sense because when I was watching some of your other interviews, you're talking about broken service, like getting oh, out and coming yeah. back in. And I was like, Where, when did that happen? Yeah, okay. right after, right? So we, yeah. we were out of the Marine Corps before the battalion even left Portugal for the washdown. Oh, wow. It was like a, like a week, 10 days. We were civilians. Like DD two fourteen in hand. Oh, driving what's that out. like then? Because oh. did you have different feelings about getting out after that? No, I was one, I was one of those four year and out guys, right? As a lance corporal, even I'm still like, after uh, on Nazaria, you still felt that same way. Like I'm done. I had other goals in mind. Yeah. that didn't involve the Marine Corps. Okay, check. Um, and my goals in, involve my wife, and I need to solidify this and we need to go forward together. And mm-hmm. all I was thinking about was her when she was telling me, stay in, yeah, stay in, yeah. you're good. And I was like, ah, I've seen this. Like, uh, anyway, my mind was made up, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. prior, prior to her, my mind was made up that I was getting out. So I go home, hit the party stage. <laughs> um, getting after it. Yeah, just is is partying it up, right? I'm I'm a I'm a combat veteran, right? Like the war, right? Abercrombie <laughs> just came out with like all that camo powder. I'm like, oh I got these and I cut my camis <laughs> off in his shorts and wore them all summer. <laughs> they have blood and stuff all Cheaper. Over them. Yeah, I was like <laughs> I was like, you I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> Give me these. So um you know, and then I stayed out for a year and a half and I worked corrections that time. Okay. At as a at a county jail in Indiana. Okay. And uh you know, that time goes and I watch, man, I watch the, the battle for Najaf and the cemetery on the news. And I always felt like I should have been somewhere else. Like I'm mm. not doing what I'm supposed to do. You can feel it. Yeah. Like I, I, I knew within a month of getting out that I should have stayed in. I should have listened to my wife and I didn't. And it's, that's a trend throughout my, <laughs> throughout my 20, trend? throughout my 20 plus year marriage. Like in, if ever I think I know, right. I need to check with her right I'm like, god i love that woman um perfect yeah she keeps me in line and it's so great i love her more now than i ever did in 2003 and yeah. before like she's so great so 
I got a call one night when I was actually on duty at the sheriff's department in jail, seeing if I would volunteer to come back in to be a replacement. We know that's an ugly term. Yeah, it's not a great <laughs> infantry one. guys, right? Like I'm not a replacement. Do like, mean? do you know who, what? Do you know I what re- I did? Who am I replacing? <laughs> do you know what I did? Right? Like <laughs> that's a, just an ugly term. So start line. So we started talking that I would go back in the reserves, a little okay. bit of extra pay, a little bit of extra money, and then I was like, I can't be a reservist. I can't go all the way. Yeah, not, I, I, if I'm going to do this, I'm going all in. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so we talked. She's like, do it. And I'm like, if I'm all in, like, this is what we're doing. This is a career. She's like, yes, that's what, yes. Go. Yep. And I got uh, called a local recruiter in Indiana, and I got off of work one morning at 6 a.m. and met him over there and started going through the process. Damn. Okay, here we go again. Yeah. And, Place up. And, uh I think, it was, I think it was like a week later, I went back down to MEPS and swore back in. And, and this I, is a year later, you said? Uh, about a year and a half. So five, six time frame? Uh, yeah, early 05. Okay. Like Check. March, April 05. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> and I swore back in. Immediately, I'm back in uniform and uh, back as a sergeant, except for I lost you know that time and grade that mm-hmm. I had. I'm just day one sergeant, which I didn't mind. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I start working for the recruiters for a few months where I go out to 1st Battalion, 4th Marines. One four. Yeah, and I got there in July of '05, and was there until July of '08. Wow! And you deployed with them, what twice? Um, Once? Yep, Eleventh Mew, and okay. then into uh, Al Qaim, Iraq. Al Qaim, and that was what? Re- what year? Seven. Seven. Six. Seven. I was there then. Yeah, I worked Al Qaim, Tarawa, Karabla, yeah. Sada, Ubaidi. Right in that time frame, yeah. but it was a lot slower then in that area because that that pacification it is slowed down right after happened. Steel Curtain, right? Iron so, Fist, uh, Iron yep. Fist, and Steel Curtain, which That's I think right. three six and three two maybe were in in that. I had uh, I had a Lance Corporal Richie come to me after the fact, and uh, yeah. he was part of Steel yeah. Fist and Iron Curtain. So I mean, through. it was it was still it was not active with with fighters, but it was active with IED cells. Oh, right? IEDs, so we had IEDs, pop shot elements. Out, yeah, yeah, we had IEDs and snipers out the yin yang on that deployment. Lost a few guys um, mm. in the battalions. IEDs found found a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Um, Huseba, Huseba at the time the the western edge yep. right on the right on the Syrian border was one of the most. It was a little five hundred meter stretch of road. Yeah, that's right. There. Is that was it Camp Gannon? Yeah. Named after Captain uh, Gannon? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Think, I think it was Gannon. And that little 500-meter stretch of road, which was their, which was the, the birth of Camp Gannon, mm-hmm. I think it was, um, was one of the, like, 10 most dangerous places in Iraq, yep. right? And then yep. we had, like, the alien's head that was, you know, this peninsula that went out into the river. Mm-hmm. And that was a mother in the, no, it was a very active place for IED cells, but we could not find a gunfight to save our lives. Yeah, yeah. No, I never got in a gunfight uh, there. I did shoot a person. Uh, not a gunfight situation, yeah. no, just a yeah. bad guy, so. you know, whatever. Um, but that, that's, um, yeah, that's, that area was poor when I was there that, that, I mean, it was ravaged yeah. in every, every city, every, yeah, that was a wild place. You could imagine that when, yeah. when Steel Fist and Iron Curtain went down, that was, um, yeah, that was my Wild. second. That was my second deployment with one four, and the guys that we took in there. I mean, one of the guys that we took in there in Weapons Company in in, in the Cap Platoons. Um, you know, Zach Happiness was just a gunny in one eight in H Gaia, and you know, still in Marine Corps this day. Great guy, you know, like got raised up right, and you know, in cat sections and stuff. We could buy an anti armor team for those that don't know what that is, and we um we rolled hundreds of miles. Uh, in that entire AO, probably thousands of miles, probably over a thousand miles during mm-hmm. that deployment, and the stress on those guys. I mean, I'll I'll take I'll take a gunfight with a hundred people any day over one IED. Oh man, like IED is it, not. It, it's horrible. You don't know the where way. they're at. You know, like it, it's just every every roll of the tire, you just don't know. Mm-hmm. So you know the stress on those guys rolling that mileage day in and day out inside of that AO, taking care of the missions that we had to take care of. Mm-hmm. You know, as the mobile infantry for the battalion. Right, we just we had a lot we had to do, yeah. And um, you know the stress on those guys and the IED finds that we had, like it was just a, it was a tremendous burden on them. Mm-hmm. And my my hats off to those guys that I was in, you know, Al Qaim with. Yeah, yeah, not a fun place to be, not a fun time to be there. It was um, definitely had my share in Al Qaim, and then later we moved into Rabwa, which was a little bit more. Uh, inside a little bit more rural and spread yeah. out but yeah that was um it was a contentious time because you had the awakening but then you also had like some of the um 
Iraqi police and the Iraqi mm-hmm. army that were moosh. You know, that they were not good. They were not no. good guys, and they would let our plans out, mm-hmm. let our patrols out, let uh, people know that we. I, I ripped out one four, I believe, um, when I was there, a squad from one four, and it was down in Carabla. And um, in our rip patrols, we had chased down an HVT, JJ, Jabby Jossums, what they called him, I think, from the movie <laughs> Swordfish. The only reason yeah. I remembered it. And they their cat smoked him with the um with a Mark nineteen, and that was like on our on our rip toe. Well, that like was that. also about the time though. There was another evolution in IEDs, right? Where they they were going less the one five five, less the ordnance, and they were trying to burn us. They were mm-hmm. using propellants. Mm-hmm. So all the IEDs were cooked to gasoline and gasoline cans, and then they had yep. the uh, um the EFPs, the expo- explosively formed penetrators, right? With yeah, the armor piercing, ar- charges, the, the improvised rockets that they were using on the flanks to shoot through the doors. Yep. Right. So yep. we were getting pretty good identifying IEDs at the time. We were getting up armored Humvees. Like our survivability yep. rate was going through the roof. So they had to, you know, it's the cat and mouse game. Yep. Like they had to adjust. That's right. And uh, they started by burning us. And that was the scariest thing for me was, was just being trapped in a Humvee burning. Uh, and it happened. Uh, yeah. It happened. it happened so many times. And uh, that was what I was worried about was, you know, the burning sets where we started wearing flight suits and vehicle, anybody in vehicles wearing flight suit, anything, yep. anything that we could do to keep the flames away. That's what we were doing. Yeah. They moved all of our, um, deployment clothing into that fire yeah. resistant operator. Yeah. Gear the frog suits, the frog, yeah. frog suits and stuff later, but flight suits initially. Um, I actually liked flight suits when I got to operate in them cause you didn't have to wear yeah, anything under yeah. them. Just drop the zipper. Oh, if you man, gotta, you, you had your second flight suit for, like, the fob that was, like, two sizes <laughs> too big. It was, like, living in pajamas. Yeah, like then a parachute you, pants. Then you had your operational flight suit that actually fit. Yeah, yeah. The one piece where you could wear all your gear. Um, I, Yeah, I miss the flight suits. For I the rest them. of my career, I was like, we should be wearing flight suits. Yeah. That's all we should wear is, yeah. like, we should develop, like, a grunt suit just in a flight suit form. And that's what you get to deploy in. That's right. Yeah. Right? And that's I what love a grunt them. should be wearing. Love them. So, what would, what would you say... Um, your mindset at that point is when when you're out there you're you're doing this different kind of operation now you're on the ground you've seen some fighting where's your head at you've been stopped lost you've been out you've come back in like you've you've went around the bush to get to where you're at which what's your head like my head was uh to endure yeah right we never dreamed Going in the invasion of in 03, that in 07, we're still there. Right. Never never thought of it, never dreamed of it. But also, the, the combat operations in that time were also slowing down mm-hmm. in Iraq. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think Iraq and Afghanistan are the same. No, no, no. It's combat not, operations yeah. stopped in Iraq a long time yeah. before you know Afghanistan. Now, we still have people in Iraq. I got it not, not taken away from them. But our offensive operations, like that really kind of slowed down. It really kind of stopped. For sure. Uh, nothing against the guys... You know, that served in Iraq, that are still in Baghdad, that are still, you know, over there, you know, being forced to deal with these drones on a daily basis. Nothing against them at all. But, like, our operations really started to slow down in the late 2000s before 2010. Yep, that's right. That's right. And then sometime around 09, I want to say June to September, Obama is going to okay 30,000 more troops for Stanley McChrystal's request to go into Afghanistan and just. Yeah, Hel- that's Helmand I, province. That, that's when I was in three three. So you <laughs> we be, were a part of that. <laughs> be in three yeah. three, and then get the call, and then yeah. that's two thousand ten. You end up in Afghanistan in ten, eleven, uh, eleven into twelve, and that's Gar- Garmshire, right? And Garmshire, yeah, Garmshire, and so yeah, I would have been there in ten, ten, eleven, twelve. You had Garmshire, yeah. you had Marja, you yeah. had Treknawa, mm-hmm. um, Sistani, yeah. Um, there was a bunch of just yeah. not good places right there all clustered together. So talk about that one a little bit, getting into getting into well, Afghanistan. So so getting I had to get to three three, right? So there was a couple of years break that I had, like leaving leaving Garmashir, or not Garmashir, but leaving Al Qaim. Mm-hmm. The monitors came to Al Qaim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they came into Iraq and I got assigned to the martial arts center in Quantico. Okay. Oh and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were trying to stay. We were trying to stay in California. My wife was like, "All right, we're staying in California. Oh. It's great. You know, we're going to stay here. You're going to go to division schools." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's what we're going to do." And I get in front, and uh, the monitor at the time was like, "All right, where you want? You want to be a drill instructor? You want to be a recruiter? You want to go to you know what drill instructor, recruiter, 
Might have been it then, other than Combat now, Instructor SOI, came later. Yeah, Combat Instructor came later, but you know it was the big three. You want to go, you want to go, you know, drill instructor, you want to be a recruiter. Ooh, MSG, that yeah, might have been yeah. it. So, and I was like, well, I, not MSG because I was a married sergeant, right? Yeah, you so said I wasn't staff and CO at the time. So I was like, I don't go to neither. Mm-hmm. He's like, uh, he's like, what do you want to do? I was like, we're getting back in November. You got anything kicking out in January? Coming right back to Iraq or Afghanistan? Like I was, you know, it was the time where get you're back like, after. Let me, you would get home and it would be great and you would be home for 30, 60 days. You feel guilty because you're at home and other guys are in the Middle East. You got to get back to the Middle East. That's right. right. Any kind of grunt worth of shit would feel that way. Mm-hmm. Like I've had 60 days at home. I need to give another dude 60 days at home. I got to go replace this guy. Mm-hmm. Like I want to go forward again. Mm-hmm. So I was like, we're getting back in November. again. anything kicking out in January? He's like, uh, he's like, yeah, no. <laughs> he's not for you, bud. Because that was when the mental health was really kicking yeah. up in the Marine Corps, right? So he's mm-hmm. like, too many deployments, too quick depth to dwell like you're leaving the fleet i'm like oh shit yeah and he's like so where you want to go like if you don't want to go that where you want to do i was like well if you're making me leave the fleet i want you know in the morning till the afternoon no week or until the afternoon no weekends no field time that's what i want yeah, yeah. give me that i'm, I'm gonna shoot the moon with the, with the you know and if anybody listening to this young guys you never say that to him you never bad, say that to a monitor bad call um so i did and he's like well what about the what about the MACE, the Martial Arts Center of Excellence? And I'm like, I can't go there. I'm not qualified. And he's like, well, you got to do a phone interview. And the, there's only one MACE, and it's in it's in Quantico. Yeah. And I was like, all right, I'll do the phone interview. So I did a phone interview. A guy named Shane Franklin. He was a, the staff in CIC at the time. He was a master of guns. He's all right, we'll give you a shot. He's like, you know, just because you come here doesn't mean you're going to stay here. We'll give you a shot. Well, I got orders cut. Oh, shit. Okay. So then I call my wife from my rack still. I love this woman patience from, from Iraq still and I was like hey just talk to the monitor she's like great and I'm like guess where we're going she's like uh, division schools like we're going to Virginia she's like click <laughs> hangs up the phone <laughs> hangs up the phone not what we want oh man not what we oh yep I'm like oh shit I like, luckily I got, I'm like halfway through the deployment yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, she's got some time to stew on that I'm in Iraq cool that out Right, heavily IED zone. Yeah, she wouldn't answer the phone for like a week. Oh man, <laughs> she, had to, she had some stuff to work through. <laughs> she had to get that get yeah. that Damon down. Yeah, she, she had to work through some stuff. Like, oh, I love that woman. Um, so I get back and I go on a submission grappling team. P Tad, yeah, yeah. I had seven months till I and I went and did MMA, you know, for the Marine Corps and trained twice a day and fought once a month, all that stuff to mm-hmm. get ready to go to the martial arts center. So then. PCS times come. We PCS. We go to Virginia. I'm at the Martial Arts Center teaching that uh, f- till 11. Yeah. And just like any good grunt, I'm looking for a way out, right? Okay, I've been non-deployable for two and two something years. I need to go. Mm-hmm. Right? I got to get back to a battalion. So, uh, you know, I get a... I, I, actually, I went to a uh, wet down. No, not a wet down, but a retirement. I went to retire. It was going... No, retirement. It was a retirement. Okay. Uh, for a guy at MSG. And there I met some MSG people, and they tried to they tried to by name request me for MSG. They actually started my TS like investigation before the orders popped. Mm. And I'm in career course, and I graduate that, and I go back to the mace, and I, and it's getting to be February of eleven, mm-hmm. and I know I'm leaving that year, right? I know I'm going somewhere, and um. You know, the boss at the time that I had as a master sergeant, he was a great guy, I walked up and I was like, yeah, I'm just not feeling it today, man. Like, I'm I'm going to take off early today. He's like, yeah, are you teach anything? I'm like, nope. He's like, all right, leave. So I went home and I got a phone call and it was, <laughs> and I don't know, recognize the number. I was like, yeah, yeah, hello. He's like, hey, is this staff? Yeah, staff's on count. I'm like, yep. He's like, hey, it's master guns. I'm like, which one, bud? Just a bunch of those. <laughs> yeah. He's like, it's Waddell. Any any of the O three sixty nines around ten or eleven time no Waddell, mm-hmm. not a nice man, right? Like not <laughs> not not going to bend over to help you out. So I, he's like, hey, you got fifteen minutes? Come by the office. I'm like, I will be there in ten. I just walked in the house. I was like, right down the road. I live on base like all the time. So I go to the Marsh Center, go up. I'm like, Master Gun, the on Count. How you doing? And like doing all. I'm like, oh shit. Like, I've made this guy mad somehow. I don't yeah. know how I made him mad, but I made him mad. Yeah. So, <laughs> this dude, he's like, all right, you're not going to MSG. You're not doing it. Okay. I'm not doing it. Got it. And he's like, but I've got three sets of orders on my screen. At the time, PCSs were shut down. Mm-hmm. 
they 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 take everybody that had homesteaded and switched them. Yeah. Um, they had switched them and going around. So he's like, but no one's PCSing right now. Got it. However, I've got three sets of orders on my screen, and uh, I will I will give you one set. And I'm like, who's going to Afghanistan first? He's like, three three. I'm like, sold. He's like, I need you there in March. This is February. I'm like, mm-hmm. easy, perfect. Click click. Okay, I'm in Virginia. <laughs> Oh yeah. I'm in Quantico. It's February. He needs me there in March. You got work to do. Yeah. Yeah. A lot in yeah, a short yeah. amount of time. Right. Yeah. So it uh so he's like, fine, click click. And he's like, get ready to go. Okay. That's what I'll do. And so I came home and I was like, We got orders. My wife was like, Great. And I was like, We're going to Hawaii. She's like Not great. <laughs> yeah, she's she's like <laughs> This summer, I was like, March. Next month. Uh, yeah, <laughs> next month. <laughs> we got to go. So everything got turned on real quick. And you got to know my boss at the Mace didn't even know I was. I received orders at that point. Oh, boy. He knew I was awaiting a decision from MSG. I wasn't supposed to leave until July. Mm-hmm. So, and we've got, a, we've got an instructor trainer course on deck. And uh, I walk in. I was like, boss, I got orders. He's like, great. I was like, for next month. He's like, oh, I'm like, all right, here's, I was like, here's the deal. I was like, man, it's uh whatever I'm, I'm scheduled to teach. I will teach. Mm-hmm. But if I'm not teaching, I'm not here. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, that's, you know, it's a fair deal. And, and, you know, the guys that I worked with there, oh man, so talented. Yeah. Good teachers, great fighters. Um, at the time we had, we had a lot of infantry guys there, mm-hmm. you know, a good number of infantry guys that had served in Iraq. And, um, Man, the guys that were there were, were, were fantastic. I learned so much. Um, like, there were, I think, six guys there that were fighting on the weekends, you know, either in amateur or professional fights. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we, had a, we had a guy there that was, like, a, like a two-time world, cha- like world champion in, like, MMA, and another guy that was, like, a two-time world champion in, like, traditional martial arts. Like, he was a straight ninja. Mm-hmm, like, great mm-hmm. guys. So, I was like, all right, well, what I'm teaching, I'm teaching. What I'm not, I'm not. And, uh... I've got to get ready to move. And that's only like 30 days. Yeah. 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 So I got everything straight. House got picked up. We went on leave to Indiana. You know, did the parents, you know, go through and um, got the car shipped and we hopped a flight to Honolulu. <laughs> <laughs> no house shopping ahead of time or yeah, nothing well, there, like that. There is not. I mean, in Going Hawaii, to base. in Hawaii, you got to be like a lieutenant colonel or above to live off base. The staff oh, sergeant's so. not, not living off base. So it's like base housing, but you got to wait for like two months. Yep. So we get there, I move everybody up to, or, you know, to K-Bay, uh, Marine Corps Base, Kennelly Bay, check mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. get us in the hotel there, because you're going to be in the hotel for two months. Yeah. Check in. My whole thing was, I'm not taking 10 days PTAD. I'm going to go right to work. I'm going to take a platoon. I got three years time and grade as a staff sergeant. Like, I'm going to be senior to somebody that has a platoon that, you know, like, I'm going to get a platoon. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I get there and check in. Get to my company. A friend of mine is the company commander. Mm. Right? It's a great time to be there. I meet now one of my best friends in the world, like one of my top three friends in the world, a guy named you know, Mike Copa. He's a major now. Um, and he's my platoon commander. And that's just what we're going to do. And I wasn't going to take 10 days PTAD that you automatically get. I was just going to go to work yeah. until I go there and they say, we're getting ready for your CGI. I'm like, oh, CGI is coming to win. They're like, days. two days. I'm like, 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm not dealing with this. Like, goodbye. Like, I'm, no. <laughs> I'm taking it. my PTAD. I'm taking the time out. I'm not dealing with this. Well, that so, ended up working out well then. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, until until the day that I come off PTAD, we're going to the field for two weeks. We're going to do a 10-day patrolling package and then four days of live fire ending in uh, like platoon live fire attacks. Okay. <laughs> I haven't been in the field in three years. I haven't done infantry. I've been a professional athlete for three years, right? Like yeah, yeah. doing physical things and fighting people. Like did you I, even wear camis up there? No. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. you did, like, not full camis. You right. Wore, you wore, like, a black T-shirt and, like, cami pants. But yeah, then yeah. we taught three courses a year and yeah. a few, MM, like, uh, like instructor courses, like, around the world or whatever. But if you weren't teaching, you were expected to PT, like, three times a day. Mm-hmm. So you come in at, like, 7, 7.30 answer some emails, talk some shit, go PT. Come back, answer some emails, talk some shit, go PT. Come back, answer some emails, talk some shit, go PT your third time, then go home. Yep, yep. Was I was on day. the boxing team over on Lejeune for yeah. just under a year. 
And literally, I put camis on for one yeah. one promotion of one yeah, of my teammates, that's it. and it was train the Dude, whole time. I'm telling so. you. So that's what, but that's what we had to do, yeah, right? Like yeah, yeah. to to get the attention of some of the best Marines in the Marine Corps, infantry, you know, whatever part of the MAGTAF you're in, whatever MOS that you have, the best guys were coming through the IT course at the time, and we had to get their attention. We had to get it somehow. Yeah, and we did it with our our teaching ability and our physical capabilities. So. And that's what we did. So I haven't been in the field in three years. I haven't done infantry stuff in three years. Yeah. Like, so, so I get to work that morning at like zero four. I think armory draw was like a four thirty. I walk in, my platoon commander's already in there, and we had that dinner. You know, and he had come over where we had talked multiple times throughout the ten days. So I knew we were getting into. He's like, "All right, this is what I need you to do." I'm like, yeah, "Stop! Just I will come and get you when we're ready for you to come out to the." to the formation like just you're not gonna tell me what i need to do yeah yeah he's like okay then i turn around i'm like oh shit what do i need to do <laughs> <laughs> you know that, that staff sergeant pride right? yeah, like, yeah, yeah. listen really? lieutenant like listen. just i'll come and get you so i go through the thing and then it, it just kick-started me back into infantry tactics and you know because we had role players out there that, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. some of the short termers in the company um played the role players and we had to like hunt down the the insurgent cell and all this stuff so it was it was good yeah, and it and it really kickstarted our relationship in a tactical way, right? Myself and the lieutenant, and then even myself and the platoon, mm. right? And so we get back from that, and uh, we go through the workup, and we eventually wind up in Afghanistan in October of eleven, Check. in the Garmish year. Check. That was not a good fight either. Um, it had settled down when we got to to Garmish year. Okay. Um, we were trying to develop the intelligence picture that we had. There were a lot of internal conflicts within the company. Um, you know, I had never seen RC activated pressure plates before mm-hmm. until then. Mm-hmm. We didn't have any detonations. We had guys that had found some, so we knew what was in our area. So what they were using, what what the the Taliban was using, is they would pretend like they were in like a farmer's field, and they would have a, a line of farmers in front of them, like you know, Operation, you know, Human Shield. Mm-hmm. And then what they would do is they see us walking down the road before. <clears throat> they had our ECM measurements, like our you know protection bubble. They would activate the pressure plate, then they could we could walk past it, mm-hmm. you know, walk over it and then detonate it. None of our guys detonated one, you know. Thank God, and we didn't lose anybody that deployment. Um, I I don't think yeah. we lost anybody in the battalion that deployment. We did have some guys get hit on vehicles, but none of my guys had gotten hit. Mm-hmm. You know, worst mm-hmm. thing we had was a guy that almost fell off a bridge, but we got that vehicle recovered and all the crew out. Nobody got hurt, so that was a good thing. Yeah. That was just one of those grind deployments where you just had to keep going. Yeah. No, I get it. And the the Taliban um, in 10, in Marja at least, for Operation Mastarok in northern Marja, it started out with, like, EFPs and stuff like that, yeah. directional charges in the walls check and then like pressure pit plate victim actuated shit and then it would be dual it'd be yeah. like they'd be hooking a phone to it so now you got a victim and an rc and yep. then they got one of the smartest things i see them do was <clears throat> they used packing peanuts in the pressure switches okay so truck one rolled over it it crushed a little truck two crushed a little more truck three it goes off so yep. now i'm looking for a trigger man because two trucks yep. made it over right so i'm not thinking so they got very cat and mousy with us uh, as so far it was as the entire time, it was, yeah. it was amazing what the, what the similarities and the differences was from each country inside, you know, hundred the, percent the theater. So <clears throat> we, we had that and it was just one of those grind deployments. Other guys had a little bit more active areas. You know, we were out in the Eastern desert almost right on the Pakistani border. It was almost like a border crossing, mm-hmm. but they weren't going to do too much in our area. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the area had already been denied to them. So it was like maintaining the denial. Yep. Yep. Uh, we did find like a madrasa, a religious school of like 400 people in it, which didn't happen. Mm. You know, everybody there that were students from the age of 45 down to like five. Oh, wow. So you knew what that was. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting <laughs> yeah, at the can't. time that if you rolled somebody up in Afghanistan for terrorism, they would get three to five years in Afghan prison. But if you could tie it to drugs. Worse. They would get eight to 11 years in an Afghan prison. Yeah. Well, the average life expectancy in an Afghan prison was seven years. So we tied everything we could to drugs. Mm, smart. 
You know, so so anything you could tie to drugs, you tied to it. If you couldn't do it, you, you did what you well, could. Well, it's not like in that country. It's not a far stretch, right? No. It's like uh, everything is fueled by drug trade anyway. Absolutely. Poppy trade and, right. and stuff. So, yeah. You know what's weird is when we know all of that and like in 10, 11, we still yeah. couldn't destroy fields. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. And, well, we got, we got back to where we couldn't destroy them. We could destroy them earlier, but then they said we couldn't destroy them. Yeah, like, it's it, like, why can't we? Yeah, it, it's all those things. We know that this is funding your entire campaign against us, and, and we won't stop it. And we know where it's going to end up. Yeah, yeah, it's And weird. most of it would end up on the streets of the U.S., right? And we just couldn't do it. But, you know, it's just one of those things. It was one of those. It was a grind deployment to try to keep the guys engaged, to mm-hmm. patrolling two to four times a day, mm-hmm. you know, try to keep a good rotation, try to keep their heads in the game, like, don't take this for granted, like... Trying yeah, to yeah, stifle yeah, some right. complacency, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, my, my wife did a great thing while we were there. We were there over Christmas, so she had emailed me, or not emailing. We didn't have email. We didn't have internet. We had a satellite phone that the guys got there on go. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, I didn't want internet in my position. I wanted them to come off patrol and talk to each other. I didn't want them to get sucked into whatever it was. Yep. So she mailed me this big package, and then the package was a little bag of... A pair of socks, some candy, some just stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, for Christmas morning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so Christmas Eve, I walked around and like in the middle of the night and just laid all these things on guys' cots. So they, they had something when they woke up in the morning. Yeah, it's dope. And that was her idea, right? Like yeah, yeah. she came up with that idea. I was like, yep, send it to me. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. That's and, great. Uh, and so they all got to wake up to like a Christmas present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, People don't realize how far little something, a little something yeah, like that goes yeah. when you're when you're in a different yeah, I lo- I reality. Love, I, I, I love the shit out of those guys. That platoon was awesome to be with, like yeah, a bunch yeah. of criminals. <laughs> uh, that's all they were, <laughs> and, and and we encouraged it, right? Yeah. So, but uh, that deployment got long. It, it was it got frustrating. Yeah, I can imagine. And so, long deployment, grind deployment. And your staff, Gunny? I'm a staff sergeant at the time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so coming out of that deployment, you're coming back to Hawaii? Yep. So we came out of deployment, came back to Hawaii. Um, they did the staff and CO sling at the time. I had another rotation do with 3-3. And they were like, oh, we're going to make you a cat section leader. I'm like, no, no, no. I already did that. Mm-hmm. I did that from 05 to 08. That's going backwards in my career, right? Like, it's I'm not, not, not forward progression. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> not like I'm going to do – I'm going to be a weapons platoon sergeant. I'm going to be a company gunny. I'm going to do something, but I'm not going back. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, those are gunny billets. Like, okay, well, you're not a gunny. I don't give a shit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm not going to go backwards, right? So that's where, you know, you protect your own career when it comes to that. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, and so, the, But they put me in the S3 as the assistant battalion operations chief. I'm like, you gave me the fire guy's job? <laughs> <laughs> like the fired Thanks. platoon sergeant, you know, but um, but that's not what I made it. Yeah, you, you were know? better, yeah. Um, you know, nothing against guys that, that that's an incredibly frustrating job. If you do it correctly, then you're taking a lot of pressure off the master guns. Yeah. And that's what I did. Yeah. And I worked for an excellent master guns, a guy named Don Wilson. He retired with like 30 years, like worked with that guy. It was wonderful. We had a great OPSO, a great S3 Alpha. It was a great experience because I actually learned how a battalion worked. You don't know how an infantry battalion works until you serve at the battalion level. Mm. Oh, this is how this, this is who I need to talk to for this. This is who I need to talk to for that. So I spent the next year and a half, the next entire rotation as the assistant battalion ops chief. Check. But, well, that probably bode well for you later in your career. I mean, it it kind of sets you up for something. Yeah, it really helped me out, right? So learn what, you know, being an operations chief was, learning the COC game, how to set it up, how to tear it down. And, uh, and, and, you know, I made it more than what it was meant to be, right? I turned it into a key billet in the battalion, had a couple of great battalion commanders that I got to watch pretty close, closer than any other staff sergeant and sure. how they did and their decision making. And it was just a great time. It was a great learning time for me. And I wasn't missing anything. We're going back to Okinawa. I was like, this is about to be my third UDP. Like, I don't need, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need to do that. So I, uh, finished my time and. And this is where it gets interesting is uh, old J.D. LaHue as a regimental sergeant major for 3rd Marines comes to me and he's like, hey, where do you want to go after this? I was like, well, I'd like to stay here on the island. My wife wanted to stay in Hawaii. <laughs> I was off island so much we didn't get to enjoy it together. So, like, I'd like to stay in Hawaii. Oh, it's great. We would like you as, like, the regimental command team. That's how J.D. will put it. We would like you to go to the Staff and SEAL Academy. They teach a sergeant's course on K-Bay. Yeah, that'd be cool. 
Okay. So I need you to put in an IPCOD package and then a staff and CO Academy package. Okay. We'll do that. Went through my career planner. Got What's all the package. IPCOD? IPCOD is a package to where like once you, so Hawaii is technically Oconus. Yeah. Once you go Oconus for a tour, you're guaranteed to go back to the States. Oh, an IPCOD package is where you volunteer to stay Oconus. Okay. Check. So we were volunteering to stay on Island. So, <laughs> so I go do the tryout for the staff in CO Academy. You got to bring them to class and you got to teach a class in front of them. Okay. Okay. So they do it, but they, that gets uploaded into a share file. Every other staff and so staff in CO Academy in the Marine Corps can see that application. Check. My career planner put in the staff in CO Academy package first, then the IPCOT package. We were deployed to Okinawa by that time. And I received orders to the staff in CO Academy in 29 Palms. Oh boy. I was about to take my wife from Hawaii to 29 Palms. That's bad. I call her on the phone. <laughs> You're seeing a trend. Yeah, it's a trend. I call her we've, on the phone. We've fo- established that now. I call her on the phone. God love this woman. I call her on the phone. Hey, I got orders. Oh, we're standing on an island? 29 Palms. Click. Click. <laughs> Did you get another 10 days? No. Silent treatment? No. No, she blocked... She dis she unfriended me on Facebook, <laughs> blocked my phone calls, <laughs> blocked emails. She blocked everything. Done with you. For like a month. <laughs> Better come back with a new answer, daddy. For like a, yeah, for like a month. And then I pulled every favor I could in the Marine Corps to get those orders changed. <laughs> Everybody that had owed me a favor, even favors I went into debt in, I tried to call in to no avail. Oh, man. Finally... The 0369 monitor at the time, he, like the DI monitor, Staff and CO Academy was handled by the DI yeah. monitor. The DI monitor at the time called him and asked for two people. He's like, I could give them to you, but I don't have to. I want this name back. We're baseball cards yeah, to the yeah, monitors. Yeah, that's fact. I want this name back. She said, okay. So all of a sudden, the 0369 monitor gets my name back and assigns me back to TBS oh, in okay. Virginia. When my wife talked to me again, I was like, okay, we're going back to Virginia. She's like, no, okay. hang on. Okay. She was okay with that. Was, I've been there before. She's okay I with I understand. Virginia. She was okay with Virginia. Better, so we go back to TBS for my, for my second time, right? I started as the, um, with the Marines Weight and Training Platoon, the pre training for IOC, the, the second and final school that I didn't graduate when I went to. So when I got there, they put me in the class with IOC, but I didn't tell anybody that my hip needed replaced. Oh, that's bad. So they put me in the CET. Because that's a PT academy. Yeah, well, when they put me in the CET, which I didn't know what a CET was. I was Mm. a staff sergeant. I'm like, it was a CET. Like, I'll do whatever. I didn't know it was like, you know, however long it is, which is more than 10 miles of like stupid human tricks. Yeah. Right? Infantry stupid human tricks. And so I got, I don't know, halfway through. I don't know how long it is. But um, I got like halfway through and I'm walking like a cripple. Like I'm not running anymore Mm -hmm. and everything is timed. And one of the captains is like, come here. What's wrong? I was like, oh, yeah, my hip needs replaced. <laughs> Probably should have told you, but. Yeah, so they dropped me medically. And they like, go back, you know, to the, to the squad bay and, like, just wait for a phone call. And I waited and I kind of went through a little bit of a self-pity there. <laughs> you know, because I'm physically, like, not used to be, like, uh, physically I could do everything that you need me to do. Just my hip was not going to do it. Yeah. I ended up working out because it was a horrible PCS because I always I moved forward of the wife and kids. Yeah. And it was a horrible time for her to try to get off island to get everything turned in. So I had to help, you know, I had to do what I could to help her out. Sure. But my wife, bless her heart, she has she has moved my family coast to coast overseas alone cuz I always kind of end up moving forward. She has put up with a lot yeah, <laughs> for man. a lot of years. Takes a special um, woman. Yeah, it does, right? And she's absolutely special. So she finally gets to Virginia. We get solidified. Finally, I get moved back to the martial arts center, you know, for another two years. And I become the ops chief for the gunner's course. I walk the year before I'm selected. And then I got selected to be a gunner. Now, talk to me about that. Because typically when I talk to gunners, and I say typically, it's only started happening more often recently. <laughs> um, but they had some kind of impression on them. At some point in their career, yeah. typically by another gunner that was like, mm, I want to be that. Yeah. Did that happen with you? Yep, sure did. Yeah. Talk about that. It, uh, my first, first platoon sergeant, John Daly, after, um, 
after my second deployment with 1-4, I got home <clears throat> from Alkine. I just happened to go to the gym at Pendleton. And I walked by and I see Daly. And I was like, dude, Daly. Like, I like I looked up to this guy for so long, even though I wasn't around him, just because he's my first platoon sergeant. He's yeah, my yeah. Barnes, right? Yep. Yeah. And so we start talking in the gym, and I invite him over to dinner, and I don't do that, right? Like, I always call the wife, like, hey, is this, like, we good? I'm like, what's the family schedule? The house, like, yeah. we have people over. So I invited Daly. I go home, like, like a fangirl. <laughs> Right. My friends come. I'm like, I'm like, Daly's, Daly's here. Daly's coming to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, he comes over to dinner that night, and that starts a long-standing relationship for the rest of the time. When I was in California with with Daly, who's over the house kind of all the time, and um, and literally, the uh, he talked to me one night. It was late. We had been drinking. Like, he's like, dude, Gunner's the way to go. He had just got selected to be a Gunner. He was, he was a gunny. You got to be a gunny to apply yep. in the infantry. So he just got selected. He's like, dude, gunner's the way to go. I was a sergeant with seven years time in service. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know that was a possibility. I was like, there's no way I could be a part of these guys. Mm-hmm. There's no way I could do that. The first gunner that I had was Gunner Packer um, in one six. Okay. This dude just floated around the battalion office in like a cloud of cigarette smoke. <laughs> But this was like before gunners had so many billets as we do now. They mm. only had like battalion regimental billets, so they just traded. Yeah. Um, but as, as a battalion gunner, I was like, dude, dude, young guys see me like I saw Packer. Mm. Was he really that old? Mm. The only thing I can tell you about Packer is like when I checked into 1-6 on November 4th, 1999, I was the youngest Marine in the 2nd Marine Division. If I had checked in the week prior, I'd have had to do the Division K cutting ceremony with the CG. But they already selected a guy, so I didn't have to do that. But I had, to do, I had to do the battalion cake cutting ceremony the week after I got there. Was he the old man? He was the old man. And I'm looking at him, and he's got Vietnam awards and Vietnam medals. And I'm like, <laughs> I have nothing. I have a, I have a marksmanship. Like, 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 I have a rifle badge, like marksman. Yeah, Not even he's expert. dommed up. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like. <laughs> and Packer was the old man, but, he, but it was 1999. He had Vietnam awards. That's how old this dude was. Mm-hmm. So... So I used to think, I was like, do these guys, kids see me like Packer? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Maybe maybe they do. I know my first um, imprint was from Vitaly. Yeah. And he was angry and he was I'm mean. Telling you. Yeah. And he traveled around in a cloud of cigarette yeah. smoke. <laughs> uh, no doubt about it. And uh, But I learned from him. Yeah. And, and walking out of a conversation, which is about any gunner I've ever talked to, uh, there's been a couple that not so much, but walk out going, ah. Yeah. I want to be that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So for me, it was daily, and I didn't even think I could be a part of these guys. Right? The second gunner I was aware of was a guy named Vince Kaiser, who became a doctor. Like, he had a doctorate. I'm like, how does that Outstanding. happen? Um, but Kaiser retired at 30, and I'm like, there's no way I can be a part of these guys. I'm not smart enough. Mm-hmm. I was never the smartest. Um, often, I was the strongest, but I could work harder than anybody. Mm-hmm. Like, no one's going to outwork me. Mm-hmm. No one's going to get here first. I'm going to do what needs to be done and go home when I'm, when I'm able to go home and mm-hmm. I go home when I want to go home. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so he put in my head and I was like, that's going to be a lot of work. He's like, it is. And I look over his shoulder and there's my wife. She's like, yes. And I was like, all right, we're going to, we're, we're going to do this. Roger this that. is, this is our goal. And I spent the next 10 years and four duty stations achieving that goal. Yeah. And yeah. when that selection list came out, I didn't even know it had come out. I knew it was late, but I got a, I got a phone call from that guy, John McCloskey. And he's like, hey, congratulations. I'm like, talks like a DI. I was yeah, like, yeah. what? You get selected. I'm like, don't fuck with me. Don't you play with my like, heart. Like, <laughs> you're, you're, playing with my, you're playing with my feels right now. Play with my heartstrings, though. So I'm, I'm staring at the list. And I'm like, ooh. Like fangirl. Oh. Yeah, dude. So, because this, this was a lifelong dream. Yeah, that's like, it. Like, this was my career goal. Yeah. And I, and I got selected and then just had to go through the training and got, you know, luckily assigned to an infantry battalion. And I lived a dream. And who'd you get assigned to? First Battalion, Eighth Marines. One eight. So let's take it from one eight. And just okay. for the audience, for the next little bit that we're going to talk about, Eighth Marines is going to be um, mainly our talk, our deep dive into HKI and what the national treasures of one eight were able to do, um, and the valor that they showed. So let's kick into when you first get there. Well, I get there um, on a Monday, October first. 
because I get a phone call. So training for a gunner starts in January and it goes to September. You got to go through four and a half months of the Warren Officer Basic Course at TBS. And then you got to go through four and a half months of IWALK, the Infantry Weapons Officers Course. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So training starts in January. I get a phone call in July, I think it was, from the uh, the TBS gunner is also the uh, the director of IWALK. He's the one that teaches IWALK. And uh, at the time, it was Ray Brown, a great friend of mine, a mentor. He's my battalion gunner in 3-3. Uh, another one of those guys that didn't care for me the first time that I met him, but I kind of grow on you like a virus. <laughs> so... <laughs> So now he's a, he's a great friend. He's like, again, one of those top three in my life that if I'm having a hard time, I can call Ray. Boom. And uh, Ray will answer the phone. And Ray cares enough about me um, to ask the hard questions. Like, if you can, like I'm not a, an easy person to talk to, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not small. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people are worried about asking me hard questions. Not Ray. Ray mm-hmm. will ask the hard question and make me really reflect mm-hmm. on how I'm behaving. So that's, mm-hmm. that's Ray. He's a great dude. Love him you to death. You need those people around you. Yeah. Lo- love him to death. Um, to this day, we'll call him if I need some. Like, love that dude. So... Um, Ray taught it and I worked for Ray the year before as the ops chief for the same course mm-hmm. so now I'm selected I go through the course I get assigned to 1-8 in July I get a phone call to Ray hey your battalion just got uh, reassigned to ITX what is now MWX it was CAX like yeah yeah whatever the, the service level training that happens at 29 Palms for infantry battalions yada 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 yep so he's like hey just got assigned to uh, to ITX they need you there the first week of October. Well, we don't graduate till September 26th. So really, I'm supposed to have 30 days of leave. I'm like, I'll be there October 1st. Yeah, yeah. So we graduate on a Wednesday. I take Thursday, Friday off. I leave Monday morning at like 03 at my house, and I arrive at 1-8 at 8 o'clock in the morning to check in. I do that. Leave on Thursday for Advon to ITX. My first week as a battalion oh, wow. gunner is like RSO and I for, uh, for ITX. And that's like a Gunner Super Bowl, mm-hmm. right? We got to put all that stuff together. And luckily, I had a great guy acting as the RCT, like the regimental gunner, uh, Tom Johnson, who never failed to answer the phone. And and two other gunners that work for the Tactical Exercise Control Group running, you know, ITX. So they had you set up even though oh, you were man. short time. It, yeah, right. So like those dudes, it, I don't care if it was two in the morning, they'd never fail to answer the phone. Mm-hmm. Both, all, like all three of them are still in. I owe them the success of 1-8 at ITX. Shout Absolutely, out. Absolutely, right. So those, those three never failed to answer the phone. Help me out because like I left the fleet as a, as a, assistant operations chief right or like a platoon sergeant Mm -hmm. i come back as a battalion gunner i was never in the fleet as a gunny Mm -hmm. i acted as a company gunny as a staff sergeant but i was never in the fleet as a gunny Mm -hmm. and uh to come back as a battalion gunner with that leap and stuff and everybody looking at me to every answer and a, and a gunner is the one that can go from private to general in any conversation have a perfect credit score until you until you ruin it until you Mm -hmm. burst your bone yep all you got to be is wrong. No mm. pressure, right? You just got to be yeah, wrong. Yeah, ever. Once. <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, so that was my first week at work was RSO and I. And uh, putting that together, like on the deck. And then uh, everybody gets there and ITX starts. I think I forgot to sleep once for like three days. And uh, I think we, we were almost done. We had like two weeks left to ITX. And the rest of the guys that I was selected with are then like on this group chat that we have, like, taking pictures and their alphas like checking in today and i'm like malnourished <laughs> already in it i'm not sleeping like it like i'm, I'm like a month into itx yeah. like fuck you all <laughs> yeah 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 but nice uh, pictures but but i learned best from being thrown in the fire and yeah. i got thrown in the fire for that and it was a great time and uh looking now, back i wish i could have done another one but i didn't What's your what's your take on the unit you're coming into at ITX then? Well, that's what I was doing was evaluating the unit, right? Yeah. So I, I, I had been able to talk with my battalion commander while he took a trip up. And uh, I'd never met this guy before. I was a student and I walk like brand new gunner, right? And uh, I was like, what are your concerns, sir? And he told me his concerns and I wrote them down and I'm looking at his concerns and I'm looking at the unit. And I think it's a unit that can be good. But it's a unit that has some horrible habits, mm-hmm. and it's a unit that needs some more direction, right? And uh, and we got there. We be, we 
we left ITX an okay battalion. We were right about average. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we were not what what we could have been or what we grew into in the future Shit. as a battalion. So we do that. Uh, we go through a workup. We leave. We deploy to Norway, right? So Marine Rotational Forces Europe. We do a bunch of exercises throughout Europe. I travel mm-hmm. the entire time. Come back, and we're scheduled for UDP. Well, scheduled for UDP. Well, that's going to be my fourth. I don't need to do that. Yeah. But uh, the division gunner offers me up to switch with a guy at Cherry Point taking a range. And I was like, he was a guy like a year after me, and he had been at Cherry Point. He wants to get him to a battalion soon. And I'm like, yeah, I don't need to do a UDP. I'm like, I'll switch with this guy. So I receive orders. Okay. So my battalion commander changes over with the next battalion commander. Yeah. Right? And I, he takes command on a Friday. I'm in the field on Saturday doing a live fire range. I have a weapons platoon package going on uh, where I take all the sections from weapons platoon and put them on ranges as MOSs, right? Mm-hmm. All the mortar sections from each of the line companies go to this range. All the machine gun sections go to this, sections go to this range. So he's like, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, sir, I got, I got live fire ranges. I'm doing this, this, and this. He's like, well, I'm, I'm, what time are you getting here? I'm like... I'll, uh, I'll be here about, you know, 5.30. He's like, I'll meet you at 5, okay? So he rolls around with me all day, and we're just talking. And I'd never met this man before, and he never met me before. We spent all day together just talking, rolling around. Mm-hmm. Well, it comes time, you know, end of the day, break between day ranges and night ranges. We go back. He's he just getting into Lejeune. He's got things to do, like family things to do. And he's like, hey, I need to, I, I can't roll around tomorrow. And I'm like, yeah, boss, got it. Like no judgment no here, right? Yeah, yeah. Like you took command not even twenty four hours ago. Like you got things to do. Like no problem. Like I'll be at every range tomorrow. And I stayed in my office that night. Went out there ranges the next day, and uh, our relationship built from there. We started mentioning it's like, well, you need to stay for this deployment. I'm like, yeah, I don't need to stay. I was like, I had orders, boss. Like hard I can't. pass, dog. Yeah, like I, yeah, that's, that's no for me, dog. It's the UDP. So yeah. it's uh, but then in December. Yeah, December, the battalion got reassigned from UDP to a MU. Yeah. Well, MUs are difficult. And uh, the option came down where, where the division going to call me. He's like, hey, we kind of want you to stay for the MU. And I was like, is this an ask or a tell? Yeah. I was like, I'm going to a cushy job at a range. I'm going to be home all the time. I really need you to tell me to do this. Yeah. If you don't tell me, my wife is going to slip my throat. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to make <laughs> like, that call for the fourth like time. I'm, like I'm gonna this the, the history with this woman is is horrible with orders. Yeah, yeah. He's like, it's a tell. I'm like, all right, terrific. I'll take it. Outstanding. <laughs> yeah. So I go home and I was like, I got a call today from Division Gunner. She's, <sighs> she's like, yeah. She's like, what? I was like, uh, I'm going to stay with the battalion and go out on the mew. And she's like, she couldn't hang up on you. No, for face, face to face. To face. <laughs> She couldn't defriend me. She couldn't hang up on me. Uh, God, I love this woman. <laughs> she's so great. And she's like, is this an ask or a tell? I'm like, it's a tell. She's like, well, you got to follow orders. You don't have a choice. I'm like, no, I don't. Nope. Yep. That's just one of those ones, babe. <laughs> and uh, and I walk in to my boss like two days later. I'm like, well, you, you got what you asked for. My orders are canceled. I'm sticking around for the deployment. I bet he was happy about that. Yeah. And we went through the entire workup. And uh, the division workup and then the MU workup, and we deployed on the 24th MU. Uh, we set a lot of standards, um, especially at Camp Lejeune, with doing ship to shore company live fire attacks mm. on Camp Lejeune that had never been done before, let alone supporting maneuver with LAV 25s. Okay. That had never been done before. So I worked a lot with range control, a lot with senior gunners to advise me like on this range and how to get this done. We went big. That's creative, uh, right? Yeah, Isn't that like, what we talked about offline? Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you. So Creativity. we did we did a lot of things that, that people had never done before. And now is a standard at Camp Lejeune. All through the leadership of this one battalion commander that, that really... Because the battalion gunner only has the authority the battalion commander gives them. Yep. The battalion commander don't care about you. You, don't, you. you can just give advice. You don't have authority. This battalion commander let me just run and let me just go do things without really asking a lot of questions. Sure. Right? Right. And the team that we had together for 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, through the division workup and going in the MU workup, the six of us, like the big six in battalion, right? The CO, the Sergeant Major, the XO, the OPSO, the, the Ops Chief, which is the Master Guns, and then the Gunner. Mm-hmm. The six of us made this team 
that didn't always get along, but we all worked. All mm. of our personalities perfectly kind of gelled. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was a battalion gunner, and I was friends, and still to this day, friends with the sergeant major. Yeah, it's not. That doesn't not happen. happen very often. Yeah. <laughs> Normally, those two hate each other. Um, and I still talk with the XO. I still talk with the OPSO. The, the six of us are still in a group chat together. Oh, yeah. And we've all left 1-8. We've all left the division and everybody doing other things. And mm-hmm. uh, it's just a great thing to have. Mm-hmm. And that was a great team to be a part of, you know, for two years. Yeah. So we deploy. We do these things. We deploy. I hit overseas, go through Europe. And we're living off of, uh, you know, special orders from the SecDef to go 30 days into CINCOM. Right, you know, go down through the ditch into the Middle East, and thirty days at a time, we're just living there. Mm-hmm. Well, we did this huge exercise in Saudi Arabia. I mean, I was given a piece of desert in Saudi Arabia by the Saudi Arabian, you know, uh, military. That they're just like, yeah, see those mountains? That's your borders. See those mountains? That's your, not not those mountains. Those mountains, <laughs> like the farther mountains. That's your. Like I drove for four hours in the desert and didn't even approach the everything your my, eyes yeah. can see. Yes, yeah, yeah. like. We, well, we that's plenty of room for some training. We shot everything. Yeah. Uh, once I was able to get in there and build ranges, I mean, I built seven ranges, three explosive training areas. It turned out to be about seventy-five surface danger zones and about thirty-seven weapons danger zones for Holy the ace shit. to come in to drop everything. You know, we did everything from from nine millimeter, forty-five millimeter pistol, five five six to five hundred pound bombs. We did that's everything. It. That's there. it. Um. The Mew, like I bought like 11 cars for targets. I bought 75 mannequins because I wanted our guys to shoot people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like like mm-hmm. it was just a great time to set everything up. It was like our own little like ITX, our own little like 29 Palms that we yeah. set up. Yeah. And um, it, it, we spent like a month there. It was awesome. And uh, we got through that with no engine and it was like, whew, okay. Fuck yeah. Now we're on the downswing of the battalion, right? I left to book Saudi Arabia, which is in Western Saudi Arabia and went to Liberia. Went to Monrovia, Liberia to set up training. Sweet. No, it's no? horrible. Why? Trying, through the government to try to get from Western Saudi Arabia oh. to West Africa. Okay. There's no government. <laughs> there's no government sponsored flights. Check. Right. You got to find your own flight. You got to get there. It was, it was so bad. So it was an ass pain. Yeah. Horribly. And let alone during COVID. During this time is all COVID. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a whole nother. Yeah. See, a whole nother shit. Um, so finally I get through Liberia plan training in Ghana and I'm getting ready to head to Albania, which is going to be on the next live fire. Get a phone call about midnight. Don't go to Albania. We're staying, we're staying in Sincom. Need you back in Bahrain. Okay. Hmm. So I'm canceling flights, trying to book another flight for the next morning. Yeah. Yeah. To get back to Bahrain, get back to Bahrain. I'm like, what's going on? You know? And, uh, get back to 51, five, like command structure. And they're like, okay, so we're going to offload the Mew into kuwait in anticipate in anticipation for operations in afghanistan okay so i'm gonna go to kuwait and set up training got it wait for a flight i'm there for like a week waiting for a flight because there's no commercial flights into kuwait Mm -hmm. gotta take military flight so it gets me the day or two before the mew is in port the day or two before i'm gonna fly into kuwait another phone call (laughs) don't fly into kuwait we need you to come to the boat. The okay. Yeah. And I don't have a car. It's in Bahrain. I don't have a car. Yeah. I Uber to the boat. I Uber to the pier. And I go on the boat and I start getting briefed that I'm going to go in as part of an early entry force with the Joint Task Force out of Bahrain. Check. To plan for possible ground operations for evacuation in Afghanistan. This is early July. Late, late July. Late June, early July. So I do that. I ECR a rifle out of the armory. <laughs> um, I can't Uber with a rifle, so I got to right. set up a flight for the next day for my rifle to get flown off the ship. And there was like three young bucks that got brought off the ship because they were going to go in as far as early entry force to look at like biometrics mm-hmm. machines and stuff mm-hmm. so we can we measure biometrics. So these guys come off. I Uber back, flight the next day, like get our weapons off, get our optics off, and we're getting ready to go in to Afghanistan. About a week later, mid July, we finally, all right, we got permission. We're going in, and um, one eight two one, which is what was on the special purpose MAGTAF, they mm-hmm. sent an early entry team, 
and then the staff for the commanding general joint task force crisis response out of out of Bahrain. We by mid July we we arrived in Kabul. Now you flew um, right into H Kaya. Yep. Okay. Flew right into H Kaya. You only fly in at night, and then uh, the next day we turned to start planning for a possible evacuation. What's that look like? I mean, what what does that look like in your head when you're told that initially? Like, well, so the so one of the one of the things about being a gunner is nobody tasks you because mm-hmm. nobody really knows how to task a weapons officer. Mm-hmm. So you just find what you should be doing to do it. Yeah, no, I mean, to me, it seems like all that happened, pow, 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 new, 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 and now it's like this is what you're doing. To me, that could seem overwhelming to some people. Like, hey, okay, now what do I need to do? Yeah, and, just, I mean, but you're it, the gunner. I'm just saying, it yeah, seems like it'd be a lot. It was a lot, and it, and it's a lot of reflection. It's a lot of thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I'm going to go in Afghanistan. I'm going to go in with a small group of people. What do I need to do when I get there? Well, I'm the eyes and ears of the, the, the battalion landing team. You know, mm-hmm. I'm the eyes and ears of 1-8. And a, a senior representative from the MU going in there. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> To plan this thing from the ground. So it was constant communication back to the ships with what the plan is on the ship, matching it to the ground. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? What do we need to adjust? Here's what I'm seeing. And are you given lateral limits by your command on what you're allowed to do, where you're allowed to go? Nope. So the whole Bagram being shut down, that was already a fo- that was already decided. That wasn't yep, going that was to already, happen. It was already shut so down. So that wasn't even allowed to... Like, nope. you weren't even able to investigate that because that had already yeah. happened bagram was already gone bagram was already shut down the people that shut down bagram was already at h gaia mm-hmm. so Check. At, so after i'm there for about a, a day or two so the anti-terrorism officer the ato for the mu which is which is a billet this mp captain was already there and i linked up with him and from there we were asked for from the army units that were there to do a, a threat assessment of H. Kaya. Sure. So we spend the next five, six days trying to get so H. Kaya was divided by thirteen different fiefdoms, right? Thirteen different compounds that each had their own security requirements, their own entry requirements, all the things. So we sat through security council meetings with the Afghans and the Turks. Mm-hmm. So the Turks really owned H. Kaya. They owned North H. Kaya, which where we were and then the runway. Sure. So the Turkish owned it. They they were reinforced by the Azerbaijanians yeah. that that held Abbey Gate at the time. The only rule that I had is I can't leave the wire at H Gaia. Nobody's leaving the wire. No Marines. No Marines. Check. Nobody. No Check. American forces are leaving H Gaia. <coughs> so I have these. So I'm I'm asked to do with this captain to do a threat assessment, and we're traveling around. We're looking for breach points. We're looking for weak points. The, the the security plan what is that and we're going around, and we're in a leaky boat like there's there's kind of gaps everywhere i'm looking at this as a military objective for the taliban i'm not looking at this as a watertight refuge from the zombie horde that it turned into mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so so we do this threat assessment we deliver it to the people on the ground at hkaya and we give it to the mu and this is where we're concerned about, right? I was concerned about the eastern portion of the runway. I was concerned about the northeastern, you know, uh, corner of, of North H. Kaya. You know, I was concerned about these things because of the the reasons that I put in there. So we, we did that threat assessment. And then it goes on, and I'm just trying to get to know this place. And then I, uh, I actually catch a flight down to the embassy in Kabul. You know, nobody drives in Kabul. I got permission to go down to the embassy. And no one's there. It's about three days before the evacuation. I was like, interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I get back to H. Kaya, and, and we kind of knew when to expect it at that time of what was being called. And uh, Now, was there communication from you guys, uh, from your command um, uh, element to the State Department? So at the time, it, uh, until the, the moment the evacuation is called, the State Department is in control. I don't know if there was communication. I would imagine there was, but mm-hmm. that wasn't at my level. That mm-hmm. wasn't in my purview. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can't Check. speak on that. But um, but once the evacuation is called, then it becomes a Department of Defense operation. Mm-hmm. Right? So the uh, finally we got permission for a full infantry company of 1-8 to come in. 
advanced parties of the two other line companies that we had, and then portions of the command staff come in. That's when my battalion commander came in. Sure. So they came in at night one night, and um, the next day, kind of the evacuation started to get called. We were, the flights were already going out of, of at-risk Afghans, right? And uh, we went around to Abbey Gate. We had a platoon down at Abbey Gate with the Azerbaijanians, and we started getting shot at by a fifty caliber Dishka machine gun. That's fun. The Russians would call that a 12.7 millimeter machine gun. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so it's basically a fifty caliber. So we got shot at all day yeah. for a few hours. And really, they were shooting at the planes. They weren't shooting at us. We were were just, they scoring any hits? Um, I don't think so. A Dishka could do it if they so, could do it right. So part of the threat assessment that I did was, you know, if someone was a trained machine gunner, um, if they were trying to do you know, basically frontal fire, like off fire on a plane, uh-huh. right? So, Or if they're doing flanking fire. So a small bullet, 50 caliber is relatively slow, right? So a small bullet, big plane, moving fast. You're probably not going to hit, mm-hmm. right? So moving targets, yeah, yeah. You know how hard it is. So if these guys are trained, they're going to take positions in these apartment buildings on the western edge of the runway, going in because most of the time, right, wind's going to come from west to east. Mm-hmm. So they're going to set up shop over here and try to shoot head on with the plane, which would make sense if they're trained. Yeah. If they're not trained, they're going to get up here and try to get flanking fire because they think that's the biggest surface area. Think it's the easiest shot, and that's what they were doing. Because they weren't trained. Yeah, mm-hmm. they they didn't know much about that gun, and they don't they don't know the the ranges that gun can hit. Um, but no rockets, no rockets, no mortars. No. Uh, we we so this we had C Rams that covered the majority of North H Kaya. Mm-hmm. So the first night we were there, the alarms went off that you know mortars were incoming. Yeah, none none you know okay none impacted. We hadn't been rocketed yet. Um, so. We spent the first day doing that, but that night is when the shit really hit the fan, where the Afghan government collapsed. Everybody left the civilian side of the airport, and there's just a horde of people came from the south mm-hmm. through the civilian terminal onto the airfield trying to swarm the C-17s. Now, what's hard for me to understand is, okay, so in writing my book, and doing some research. I had guys on the ground over there that I was trying to get out. They're giving me information. Essentially what he, you know, what my guy told me is uh, the SIV credentials that were needed from the embassy and the State Department that were given to Terps and, and high-value mm-hmm. high value Afghanis basically just got airdropped to all their relatives. Yes. And then it just became a two-jump bubble and everybody yeah, had you, it. You'll hear that on the HBO documentary, too, talking about is how, that there, how it there, went were, down? there was no names on them. Right. So everybody was airdropping everything to everybody else to try to get them out of there. Mm-hmm. That, that happened. You know, the first couple of days, so evacuation didn't really start until after the airfield was quelled. Um, yeah. The airfield was a couple of days of, of, that was some pretty turbulent time. How does that start, though? So you had Marines on a place that got overrun, or yeah. was it the Azerbaijanian or yeah. Azerbaijan people? So they came straight up. So, this, so the south side of the terminal was a civilian terminal. Okay. Right? It's a civilian and military airport. North side military, south side civilian. When the Afghan government collapsed, everybody left work and went mm-hmm. home. So the civilian side of the airport was completely abandoned. So you have this horde of people, these civilians that came through the civilian side out onto the airfield. Because nobody was there. Nobody was there. To stop them or direct them. That's or- right. And so we were, we, it was about midnight. We were walking into the Joint Operations Center. I was with my battalion commander. And I was excited about mid-rats. Anybody in the military, you know, I know what mid-rats are. Get some. They're wonderful. So I was excited to go to the chow hall to get some food. We hadn't eaten all day. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> and we just hear the planes are being overrun. We look on the drone feed, and we just see this crowd around one of our C-17s. And it is pick up the gear that we just dropped, and we're just running out, grabbing people around the hallway as we're running out to this thing. There's no plan, no communication. There is, we got a job to do, let's go do it, and we're going right now. Mm-hmm. We had a little less than 200 actual fighters on the ground with 1-8. And uh, we were running out there, and guys, man, uh, those guys did exactly what they were trained to do. They hit that, they hit the airfield and started gliding with their shoulders and their, their rifles in their shoulders. Like, nope, this is a prison riot. Get shoulder to shoulder. Like, I'm, I'm running up and down. Like, nope, prison riot. Let's go. <clears throat> yeah. And Because I knew what we were running into. I knew we couldn't shoot anything. Mm-hmm. So we hit this crowd and started pushing people back. So there, at, that, at that point, there's probably a little, 
there's probably about 5,000 Afghanis on the airfield. So and 200 of you? A little under. Trying to corral cats? And just pushing them, mm-hmm. right? Just it, it is a fist fight. And, uh, are and they fighting back or are they just scared and some, desperate? Some. Some are. Yeah, but scared and breast, desperate is enough to push on you. Yeah. And uh, that the mission was the runway. Yeah. Keep the runway open, all costs. Doesn't matter what you have to do, keep the runway open. At that time, the runway was closed. So no planes can come in and no planes can come out. We have to get this runway cleared. Yeah. So some are fighting back. Some aren't. Some people just have families there and they're desperate. You know, but we start, we have to push them off. And uh, and it got it got violent, right? Mm-hmm. Like it got violent with them. It got violent with us. Um, but the thing that swells my heart with pride is no Marine lost their composure. No one said this is too hard and ran. No one was too soft and and you know, and didn't put enough force in to push the crowd back. That crowd by pushed back, and we pushed them back all night long. Mm-hmm. And just before sunup, we got them to the south side of the air, airfield, which is about a mile. Um, you know, three quarters of a mile to a mile. And we pushed them across. And and once we got them over there, because we didn't have a plan once we got them over there. Yeah. I, I remember. Now you got to think, huh? I remember the Master Golden Guns man. was out there. And, yeah. It, even the, the senior people in the battalion were right there, shoulder to shoulder with the young guys fighting these people. And at one point, he turns around and he said, what is the plan? I'm like, I don't know. We just got to get them over there. Like, I have no clue what the plan is. We're making this up as we go. Mm-hmm. Once we get them to the, over to the civilian side, they start going back to the airport and start coming down to like the skywalks to load planes because there was a couple of planes that were abandoned, mm-hmm. right, like on the loading docks. So at that point, we're putting ratchet straps on the ladders and trying to rip the ladders off of the, the skywalks so they can't follow that and get mm-hmm. behind us. Mm-hmm. It's... Um, Finally, we realized there's gates on either side. So, okay, let's create a human tunnel, funnel them out to the gate, and they can get to the south side of the airport, and we can start relieving this pressure. But once we opened that gate, we saw the the Taliban checkpoint. Mm -hmm. So once we're trying to file them out, and they realized where they were, they ducked completely back in. So they were faced with Taliban bullets or our fists. It's an Mm -hmm. easy choice. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And that was all night long. And then we started getting shot at by the Taliban, our guys were firing back from the Taliban. Like it, it, it was a it was a war zone. That's all the stuff that wasn't being showed and um, and reported on, which we kind of talked with uh, about offline. But um, I had no clue what you went yeah. to until the till the HBO docu series came out <laughs> yeah. some time later. Yeah. Um. Wild. Yeah. Talk about. Talk about the the courage and valor of the everyday infantry grunt marine in H. Kaya. So once, so we, we, so we established, you know, we got some wire called up, right? And we started wiring people in so they couldn't just break out. Mm-hmm. And we had, sta- ex- you know, exchanged rounds with the Taliban, you know, on the, uh, what would have been the Southeastern side of the runway. We, we, we exchanged rounds with them. You know, they stopped firing and we, we put wire out to try to, block this access off there's still sniper rounds coming in from the Taliban mm-hmm. and there's still AK rounds coming in every once in a while so you know some pop shots from the from the airport mm-hmm. these guys behind the wire couldn't get down they couldn't run for cover they just had to stand there and take it mm-hmm. and they did mm-hmm. I mean rounds landing feet away from them and they just stood there like walls because they knew if they left the wire, those people were busting out and were back to square one. Mm-hmm. So the valor that they they that they displayed was just. It's hard for me to put into words. I'm not very educated, <laughs> but the the pride that was in my heart just seeing these guys fight their hearts out. I mean, you have machine gunners standing there, like throwing butt strokes with two forties, right? Like. We don't train to do that, but mm-hmm. that's the weapon that they had, and that's what they were going to use. Mm-hmm. Um, there were guys that were um, struggling to maintain their position, and, and you know, and not to break our lines, and they they didn't they didn't break they they never broke. Mm-hmm. All this moral and physical courage that we talk about, all this endurance that we stress to people with sleep deprivation, all the all the other bullshit. Try being in a fist fight for six hours. Mm. 
And that's what these... A fist fight for six minutes is hard. Yeah, but that's what these guys did. And, and that fist fight continued for the next 18 days. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what they displayed. And they never faltered. And you know what? To a man or to a woman, you walk around and you had smiles. Because they were happy to be there and happy to serve. Yep. And happy to accomplish the mission that they were they were told to accomplish. Yeah. And doing it good. Yeah, so like that, that, that time, and it's in it's in the documentary when that guy came out of the uh, on this loading dock and started to lower his AK. This one beautiful little son of a bitch, Lance Corporal. <laughs> I have pid one shot, like killed him stiff. Cake eater. <laughs> yeah, just great. The, this this split second decision. You know it. Um, it was perfect. Yeah. Then you know the next guy came out. I shot that guy, and then two squads opened up through the crowd before they had a chance to get down all this all happened within a few seconds through mm-hmm. a crowd before they had a chance to get down never touched a civilian with bullets but they killed an entire squad of taliban in and outside of that building and they only fired for a few seconds and the squad leaders which were two of our top in the battalion they just cut the fire and everything and you just see them searching and assessing looking for more targets the crowd had gotten down but they performed absolutely perfectly yeah right yeah and, um, oh, and that's for you. Has got to be oh, man. bang your chest. You know it. You know it. Uh, to be there to watch those guys, to watch their progression from the beginning of a workup through a division workup for a year and a half. We we worked with these guys, and to see them in action perform exactly the way you would hope and expect them to perform was just one of those things. Like, yeah, boys, like you got it. Like, Boom. good job. Yep. And uh, and after that, you know, that's when the people broke out again. And it was just constant tug of war to, to fight the crowd back. They would bust out, fight the crowd back. And that's when you see on the videos and the Twitter videos and documentary about the people getting on the on the uh, on the airplane and, and falling off the, the Hercules. Yeah. You know, they they you know, they got on the C seventeen wheel wells and they started falling. Like like they thought they were gonna like the, that shows you kinda of like the mindset and the education level of some of these people yeah, over they here. They thought too. they were gonna make it there, right? Like yeah. but you gotta remember there's some villages in Afghanistan that don't know what year it is. They don't know what a month it is. They don't mm. have these times mm. of of current, you know, they don't have this perception of current time. Yeah. So some of these people thought they were going to ride the entire way that way. Yeah. They, they don't know any better. Yeah. But that also shows the desperation. Oh, yeah. With, with your world ending, what are you prepared to do yeah. to get out? Yeah. And that's what they were prepared to do. Some of that's admirable. And the other side of it to me is uh, watching watching people throw girls into sea wire and step over them or watching babies get moved through a crowd the way that they were. Well, now you're going into the grind of the gates. Well, that's a different right? grind, like, but it, I'm saying it, desperate people will do desperate yes. things and it's not always good desperate. It, it's it's not right. And, and in some of those countries, the men are, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom that being happening no. in the United States. Right. So e- even without military, with our civilians, I couldn't fathom them. Yeah. So the airfield gets quelled by an Afghan special forces unit comes down from Lashkar Gah. Mm-hmm. Like um, on the documentary, you'll hear my boss say it was like you know a, a night and a day, and then the next night they came down. I thought it was like three days, but that's where you go into the sleep deprivation, yep. the exhaustion, and what time does to yourself. Right? Yep. Yep. So. I thought it was at least two days, two nights. So there, there's some. Oh, by the by the way, we we also had COVID on the airfield too. Yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> right? sure. So, um, so it starts going into the exhaustion. But uh, but yeah, like when we linked up with this Afghan special forces unit, you know, like I linked up with them with my boss, and they came down through when they hit the airfield, and you know they did what they had to do um, to help clear. Yeah, what the does airfield. that mean though? Uh, they. What did they have to do? You know, an Afghan killed Afghan, right? So the Afghan special forces came down through and they started, you know, they, they killed a bunch of the civilians. Um, it didn't make the news because it wasn't us doing it. Mm-hmm. Like, I really think that the Taliban acted kind of like as cattle herders and, and corralled the civilians to the airport to try to get us to create a mass casualty incident so that would legitimize, legitimize their government. Yeah. I really think that's what they were doing. And then they can turn around and use that uh, propaganda campaign against Absolutely. us in and, Kabul to, to kind of quell and, their citizens. And no matter how justified they were, our guys never gave in to that urge. Which is amazing. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing yes. that they didn't. You know, yeah. so, but then, you know, so that quelled the airfield. And then, um, 
And then the Afghan special forces were told to set a defense to the south to not let that happen again. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's when the gates were really solidified. And that's when the grind at the gates for the next two weeks really started. Did they ever get back on the airfield after that? No. So that was enough for him. That was enough. What, um, I watched the special and I know they lined trucks up and kind of did what they had to do. What's that mean? Was it hundreds of people killed? Was it thousands I don't of people know. killed? I, you, you just watched headlights mowing them down like grass, right? Like if you watch a lawnmower mow grass, picture tens and fifteens or twenties of lawnmowers mowing grass at the same time. That's what it looked like with running people over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was horrible. Not, it's not good. It's not. It, it, and it was desperate people trying to do things. I say it's not good. They had to do what they had to do to get that right. operation moving, and I understand that. Yeah. But to be on an airfield where that's happening and you know that's happening, I don't care who you are, later in life, those are human beings, and you're going to think about that. And not even later in life, right then, because it's not even like they're the enemy, right? It's like they're scared of the same people that you don't like yeah. and that we've been fighting. So yeah. it's like you almost understand – there's legitimacy in their fear yeah. and in their desperate hour. But, um, but that, so the, the amount of people in that crowd that actually spoke English in between them breaking out of the wire and us fighting them back, we would try to talk to them. We're like, listen, you can't be here. If you want out, you have to go to a gate. This airfield has to stay open, right? There's not an airport in the United States that deadly force is not authorized for trespassing. Yeah. One or two of you. Look fishy, let alone right, like, twenty five thousand. Yeah, of you. like and and every ten hours the crowd size would double and double and double again. Mm-hmm. You know, the night that that happened, I looked across the airfield and all I saw was people. If the Afghan special forces weren't there that night, I don't know if we would have kept it or not. What do you mean? I with, the, what, with, the, with what a, does that mean? With a little under two hundred people to try to hold off fifty thousand. At a, at a quick guess, because... No, I, I mean, just what does that mean for I, your would, element? They would have taken North H. Kaya. They would have taken the compounds. They would have swarmed the planes. If if that Afghan unit wasn't there, I don't know how that night would have ended up. Mm-hmm. I know from here, seeing that, seeing them bring Apaches and stuff over the airfield to try to scatter people, and which was yep. may, maybe beforehand, <clears throat> I'm thinking... All it takes is a couple of rockets, a couple of mortars to jam up those main runways one, they're using. One vest. One S vest. You know, it, 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 so much could have happened with us fighting that airfield. And this whole thing, like we had, we were standing three, five, seven yards off the runway and C-17s are landing and taking off. And we're just trying to hold them back to let these planes go. Because every plane that would land, every plane that would take off, that's a win. Like that's a victory. Yeah. Because the, the runway was the mission. Yeah. Right? And after we would get pushed back and we would push them back, right, that runway would just be filled with flip-flops and sandals and all this shit from human beings. And the planes could just take off and land, right? And yeah. every every time we saw that, we just, that's a win, right? That airfield's open, right? That's a win. Yeah. But without those Afghans there. Um, well, because that's your ride, too. Like at the end of this, that's your ride too. So if the airfield gets closed and overran, yeah. So that's the thing. There's no if this mission fails, and this is when it all costs. Right. This is a mission. If we don't win, we absolutely die. Because if the airfield fails, there's nowhere for us to helo to to then fly out. Right. Right. Just with our heads in shame, but we're alive. We have to win this. Yeah. But this is the only time, like my first trip in the Middle East was in 2002, like we talked about. My last trip was in 21. This is the only time that I questioned whether we were going to win or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In my head, can we win this with what we're doing right now? Mm-hmm. And we just endured. Endure. Sometimes that's what it comes to. Endure physically, endure mentally, endure emotionally. We just have to endure because the entire time we're on this airfield and we haven't even got to the gates yet. The entire time we're on this airfield, there's no sitting down. There's no water. There's no food. If we would have brought food and water out to our guys, then they would have ride it over food and water. Mm -hmm. There's no sitting down because there's not enough of us to hold the wire and then go sit down. Yeah. Right. Let alone, I I hadn't 
before this started, I had my socks in an order of precedence. Worst socks to best socks. I had my worst socks on and got stuck. Case in point to all the guys out there listening, always wear your best socks. Yeah, yeah. My feet were tore up yeah. within the first few hours. Yeah. And this is like two days of this shit. Socks are important. Before the gates. <laughs> Before the gates. My feet are tore up. Yeah. You know, so it in in that airfield fight to keep that thing open, that was that was a testament to what these young people are able to do these days. Mm. And willing to do. Mm. Savages when they need to be. Oh man, I'm telling you. And, and yeah. just willing to stay there and do the hard things and, and accept the hard orders, right? Mm-hmm. I used to tell guys, like, how, how are you going to follow an order to hold a defensive line where you're being overran, where you can't follow an order to make your bed in the morning? Boom. Right? How That's does that where the happen? attention to what, detail comes from. Yeah, right? what, is, what is that thing, right? I'm a full follower. Like, you want to win a war, make your bed, right? That's the start. And like, the small wins during a day and following the orders, all these things. And people are going to laugh at that, and I don't give a shit. Mm-hmm. It's the small disciplines that went to build big discipline. And none of these guys faltered. Yeah. You know, the, the, what my boss and the sergeant major and everybody built as far as leadership in that battalion and what we were able to do, built this, this culture of victory and built a culture of these savages that are willing to fight tooth and nail to win the day and accomplish the mission. And it was great. It was a great thing to be a part of. Shout out to all those guys on HKIA. For sure, um, the stories continue to come out. The, the, um, the dialogue continues to, uh, to, to push. And, and, and on this channel, we're going to talk to as many of you as we can. Um, because in a, in a time like that, when you have a bunch of lions that hold the line, there's something infectious and contagious and uplifting. And yeah. even though it wasn't... <laughs> Maybe what you thought you would do as a as a as a combat guy, yeah. as an infantry guy, it was a different mission. Um, but from every account and everything that I've heard at the tactical level, those dudes were were bomb. I'm Lions. telling you, there is no twenty years in and out of combat, right? With multiple divisions and, and multiple different reg- regiments and battalions, there is no better display of the old adage of uncommon valor was a common virtue than what those men and women did at age Kaya. Mm-hmm. It was so hard to sit there and single out people because everywhere you look, people are doing great things everywhere. You look, there was one, there was one, uh, I think it was a motor T guy that we had a couple of Afghan casualties, um, at one of the holding areas that we had. And he was told, Hey, get up, get out there and go get them and bring them back. And he didn't ask how. He didn't ask what to do. He mm-hmm. ran out on the airfield and hot wired like a baggage loader, like the with the conveyor yeah, belts, yeah, and just drove it down there. And he came back with like two or three stretchers strapped to that conveyor belt. It <laughs> just went directly That's to the hospital. It. That's it. Um, it was all about you know just uh, you know winning the day, accomplishing the mission, and doing it as best we can. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're not even going to get in, guys, to the to the planning, uh, to the strategy side of this, there's people that can do that, that have clearances that have all the information and, and they can talk about that. And at this point, you know, a year and some change later, a lot of people have, have already done that. They've, they've looked at hearings, they've looked at oversights, they've looked at committees. Um, and that is not what we're here to do. What we're here to do is talk to Gunnar Callen about his career and then talk to him about uh, let him highlight these national treasures that were on that airfield at the tactical level doing doing good work. And um, and I think we've kind of accomplished that. Um, we can keep going, but I want to make sure that my audience knows the focus is not a politics. Yeah. It's not policy. It's not strategy. As much as I may have talked about that before, this is about tactical level fight with, uh, you know, hard chargers, war fighters, put in an extraordinary situation um, and then behave that way. Yeah, we. So after the airfield was quelled, um, within a few hours, we were ordered to partner with the Taliban, that they were going to help us out on Gates and be our outer cordon. Mm-hmm. That was not something anybody liked. It's not something anybody looked for. It was a surprise coming down because we just had gunfights with them a few hours prior, and now we're going to partner with them. Um, there were multiple times that it got hairy with the Taliban on the gates that our people acted absolutely with honor and professionalism 
and uh, with the leadership that we had there, both NCO, staff NCO, officer, even even at the the, the mid levels at the company levels, like it would that that shit was quelled. Um, we've been talking for a long time about the career and what I've done and multiple deployments and everything I did. I believe led me into this mission with H guys, so I could I could advise as much as I could. Um, you know, we established these gates, the three gates: East Gate, North Gate, and Abbey Gate. And uh, those, every man or woman that served on those gates, their life was on the line every second mm-hmm. that those gates were open or closed. If they were there, their life was on the line because of our proximity to the public and this horde of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people outside of every gate. Mm-hmm. Um, they fought with heart. They fought with honor. Like they fought with endurance. We've been going for a long time on this podcast. It's uh, to get into. I cannot say my appreciation for these young people in these gates. My admiration. I still talk to a bunch of them. Um, I talk a bunch of staff and CEOs, the officers, all the way down to the young kids, even though I'm retired. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I still talk to them because they, they, they have a special place in my heart forever. Mm-hmm. When you do that with somebody, it doesn't really matter the rank game and the no. billet game. And when you are in desperate straits and all you have is another American yeah. to look at and say, hey, I'm with you, that, that it hits different. Yeah, once you uh, once you look over as like a Lance Corporal, you see a battalion commander fighting the same right you are. <laughs> right? Get some. Or your sergeant major. Or your gunner. Or the, or the battalion XO or the gunner, right? Yeah. Like we, we were all shoulder to shoulder in the lines. Um, for 18 days Mm -hmm. and their lives were on the line every second they were getting shot at they were fighting riots Um, we get into the Operation Pineapple bullshit to where these guys came over to try to get one person out but they would create either a hole in the wall they would create a riot in the the crowd trying to come through our gates Mm -hmm. and then that's great you have your one person you have your two people they go to the civilian terminal and try to process them through the combat logistics battalion processing them out but we got to fight a riot for three hours because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a government cell phone. First time I've been in a combat zone with a cell phone. I had a government cell phone. I don't know how, how many congressmen texted me because their friend has a brother that served with a guy that has a cousin that has a turp that he served with. And he said, Northgate, can you get him out? Mm-hmm. At first, I was very tactful. He's a congressman. I was very tactful. I was like, oh, sir, you know, we'll try, yada, yada, yada. At one point towards the end, I was uh I received a text message like hey gunner congressman so and so yada 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 I have this guy that a buddy of mine served with with my cousin all this other shit he's in Northgate right now wearing a yellow t-shirt can't get him in I just happened to be in Northgate just take a picture yeah I was like click show me a guy in a yellow t-shirt and just miles of people yeah, yeah. never heard another thing yeah you know well see and I think I think a little bit of that is the disconnect that we had in the media yeah. here we had you know, a media that wanted to portray a certain yeah. narrative and they didn't show yeah. a lot of what y'all were doing. Yeah. They didn't show what special A and A elements had to come in and do. No. We got to see the end of it. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff that happened leading up to the Abbey Gate exploding was not Yeah. It was wasn't I mean, we seen that it was bad. But until HBO did their thing, until the interview started rolling out, nobody knew what happened there. No. Nobody knew how bad it was. And, and, and that's the thing, right? Like, it, like my. But dad. that's a problem if you are a congressman and you don't know what the fuck is going on, which is another big point of this platform. We have junior and freshman congressmen and women that don't believe this shit's real. Yeah. And they want to take money from it. It's not okay. Anyway, sorry. It's, it's not. I mean, my dad texted me at the start of it. He's like, you're looking pretty bad over there. I'm like, you ever heard of the Alamo? <laughs> this is the Alamo. Yeah, right? Like this, this is the Afghan Alamo. Yeah. Um, there's nowhere for us to go. We, if we lose this, we can't get out. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what these men and women, whether they realize it or not, that's what they were up against. But we, re- we as the senior leadership of the battalion and the MU, realized it every day. Mm-hmm. And we were inventing tactics. Um on the spot to get these gates to work yeah. um, to get, to open it up, let four or five people through to shut it. Now, do you have bangs? Do you have flashbangs? Oh, yeah. Do you have smoke? Um, so less lethal. Yes. So, so normally like I brought in, you know, so as a, as a battalion gunner, we also do ammunition, right? Mm-hmm. So going in for this operation, 
a guy with a Mu S4, and I get the standard non-lethal weapon suite that would that we would bring into anywhere. Once the airfield started, we went through that in a matter of hours. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that. Yeah, and <laughs> so the, so then you know the Mu S4 was there, and I got with him. Great dude, love the shit out of this guy to this day. Because I went to him, and I was like, Mike, and he's like, what's up? What do we need? I was like, I need I need flashbangs, I need stun grenades, um, and I need CS gas canister, uh, CS canisters, or CS grenades. And um, and I was like, if you can, give me give me uh, rubber bullets to the shotguns, and give me 40 millimeter baton rounds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In a non-lethal situation, and there has been weapons for years, for over 10 years, that affect a full frontage that we could have used that would have, that would have been great, right? So the non lethal about like personal like, weapons, or are you no, talking about like, like embassy like, defense weapons? Like I'm talking about non lethal weapons that make you uncomfortable and create a frontage, like directed energy weapons, yep, yep, like yep, all that yep, stuff. Yep, trucking. There are weapons that have been around for over a decade that could have been used to create a frontage, create standoff to make this an orderly evacuation that we did not have access to. Mm-hmm. Even me as a battalion gunner, when we're going through the non-lethal package, and we 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 had more non-lethal trained people in a in a, in a BLT that most Mu's had. Like we had every company trained because we just happened to have some white space. And uh, if you can't affect a mass of people with a with a piece of non-lethal weaponry, you're affecting shit. Mm-hmm. Affecting one people doesn't do a damn thing when the world is ending and you have a zombie horde outside of your gates. That's essentially what you're facing too. You're facing a bunch of people who already think they're dead. Well, that's what we called them, the zombies, right? right? Because anywhere that they could fit into, they fit. It was it was water, right? Like if you put a sandcastle on a beach while the tide is coming in, that's what H. Kaya was. Yep. So there was directed energy weapons that if, if we would just focus on what this is going to be with a full range of military operations and non-lethal, you know, non-lethal weapons and, and non-combatant evacuations, what it's going to be in the future. Mm-hmm. If we could just focus on that with these, with these weapon systems, create a mass frontage, create standoff. IEDs aren't going anywhere. SVS aren't going anywhere, right? This is going to be ever prevalent on the battlefield from here on. And it yeah. has been in the past. We just changed the name of it from booby trap to IED. Yeah. So if we just invest in these things with a full range of military operations, and these guys have to be trained to go from non-lethal capability to lethal capability, back to non-lethal capability, back to lethal, that's going to be the battlefield from here on out. Yeah. Civilian considerations are going to do nothing but skyrocket. The world's not getting less populated. Yeah. And everywhere that we fight is going to have a huge population that we have to protect or get out if we want to be morally correct. Hmm. So the ability for these, I think the Marine Corps is starting to call them inter- intermediate force capabilities. Okay. These capabilities going forward are going to save time, save energy, make things easier to evacuate, but also save minds. Hmm. If you get a young guy that's not that doesn't grow up in, in a violent area, right, or a viol- doesn't have a violent past as far as violent sports or anything else, yeah. if he doesn't have to do violence, you're saving his mind. Let him do something less. Fact. Right? So you're, you're saving all these things, but we just have to realize this is an important capability to utilize going forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Check. I couldn't agree more. And, um, and then maybe, you know, like I said, we're not going to talk about strategy, but maybe we plan better, uh, better standoff and stuff when we can. Yeah. Maybe we, maybe we don't stick to timelines if it doesn't make sense. <laughs> maybe we don't fight an enemy for 20 years and then pretend that they're going to safely partner with us at yeah. a gate when we're pulling out. However, we're going to stay off of that. But, um, God damn, it's been a, we've been doing at this for a minute now. Yeah. Save rounds. Um, you're retired now. I'm retired. I'm fully retired. Are you enjoying retirement, or was that like two days and you picked up with a contract company? So it's one day at a time. <laughs> I, it, like I, I, I walked into a job. I was extremely lucky walking yeah. into a contracting job that focused on training education inside the Marine Corps. Boom. <clears throat> um, I'm extremely lucky to have that. There's multiple reasons why I retired, right? Like that would almost be a podcast in itself. Well, maybe uh, of, we, we of, can bring you back of retirement reasons, right? Like, and, uh, anytime you want to have me back, you just make the call brother and I'll, and I'll be here. But, um, but I retired, um, we got back in October, September, October, uh, when we got off deployment and then I retired the next March, I've been retired for about six or seven months now. 
And uh, shit, I guess I retired in March, but my EAS was was May 31st. So we're going on, I guess, nine months since yeah. I've actually worn a uniform. And it's one day at a time, man. You know, people ask me, like, what's retirement feel like? Like, if you were to take, uh, I don't know, Rambo's knife from e- any Rambo. And stab right? it right in the back of you. <laughs> no. If you were to take that knife and put it in, in, in a drawer of silverware in your kitchen, that's what I feel like. Yeah. Say, talk you know, on that. Um, this deadly weapon in with these bunch of harmless things. Yeah. Shelved. You know, but uh, but our shelf life is short in the Marine Corps. And, you know, in, in, in the Marine Corps as a whole, let alone the infantry. Mm. It was time for me to go. I have no regrets about it. But uh, it's one day at a time, and um, you know, I've got I've got two kids that are active duty military right now. You know, one's Army and one's Marine Corps. Oh yeah. And uh, and one that's a junior in high school, and he will go into one service or another, like when he graduates. So you know, where one was there, come three. Yeah. And uh, they are the absolute, absolutely light of my life. You know, I've got a lieutenant that's the oldest one. I got, I got a Marine Corps Lance Corporal. Hell yeah! And I've got, <laughs> and I've got one that wants to go in the fucking Space Force. Hey, I'm about it. Because he wants to. If you go remember back to the start when we started this thing, he wants to. He wants to blaze his own path. Yeah, man. Go right? on. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I support him completely in that shit. And uh, and he's highly intelligent, and all my kids are. All my kids are so smart, mm-hmm. and uh, they're, they're led by Mama, and she is the my best friend, the light of my life, and she keeps me in line. I love her to death. Yeah, you need a special woman if you're a warfighter. That's a fact. And she is absolutely the the special, the special because I'm not easy. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the that's the. There's a lot that comes with the job, especially yeah. over years and years and years, and then campaigns like that. Um, a lot of people don't marriages don't make it no. I and mean, you know that as well as I do so yeah. when you find somebody it's like yeah I was a grunt for 10-15 years oh yeah when did you marry your wife yeah right before our first one it was a rough one it's like <laughs> um, so that woman right there like the dude is cool we're, we're away doing what we love they're at home running everything yeah. regardless if they love it regardless if we're here regardless if it feels good Regardless if they're moving in 30 days, four times. And then they got to put up us, put up with us when we get back. And then you come home and, and then they, yeah. and they watch us go downhill and they try to help us as best. They yeah. Can. You got to watch your best friend just completely, uh, spiral yeah. out of control. And sometimes forever, depending on who you are, sometimes, um, uh, in our community, you know, the significant others watch that all the way into yeah. a, into a, into a coffin. Yeah. Some, some of the good ones, some of the strong ones, the stronger women can help pull us out of that. Um, but at no point is it easy being a military spouse, especially of an infantry or a no. combat guy, special forces guy. And uh, my hat's off to all of you. Um, a special thing. And uh, go ahead. I just, I can't agree with you more. She, uh, she has pulled me out of downward spirals more than once. Yeah. And, uh, and she stays. Yeah. And I have given her more calls to leave um and i'm getting in my feels right now but i've I've, I've given her more calls to leave than i think to than to stay but she just stays and she comes in and she snaps me out of whatever i'm in Mm -hmm. and we just we just keep going forward and uh she's the love of my life i just i i couldn't get i could not imagine life without her and i can't get along without her yeah endure Oh. That word just keeps coming up. Endure, yeah. endure, endure. And she endures. Mm. And uh and she endures the, the shit that I put her through and I endure the shit that I went through and you know, it it, it all just that fire that just forges us. Mm. Gunner, sir, Bill, I appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate you coming. Uh again, guys, if you if you learned something today that you didn't know about HKI, or if you learned something in general at all, if there's anything that was said in this podcast that moved you and that needs to be shared, share that out. Share that out. And again, make sure you click in the subscribe button. Make sure you click in those bells because, guys, the more of you that do that uh, algorithmically, the more that this message will fester and get out to uh, to the greater population. So, again, I appreciate you being here. We're definitely going to have you back on to do some more, uh, some more talking. And... Um, and I look forward to the future. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. And anytime you call, I'll be right here. Perfect. All right, guys, for choices, not chances. Thanks for tuning in. Next time. 
Well, that concludes this episode. Thanks for listening to Choices Not Chances podcast. Please share, like, and subscribe wherever you listen or watch our podcast. You can also follow us on social media at Choices Not Chances podcast. Thanks, and have a great day. Louisiana Gun Shop, your firearm headquarters, specializing in concealed carry guns, ammo, and training. You can get your Louisiana permit with us. Also, a large selection of AR-15s, or if you are that build-it-yourself type of guy or gal, we have all the parts to build and customize your own AR-15. Glock, Sig, Taurus, Ruger, we have all the brands, both in the store or at louisianagunshop.com. Not too far. You're marking a building. Hit him. Yeah, that's good. That's a good shot. That's a funny. Yeah. Funny.